Good morning and welcome to the Public Safety Committee's Fiscal 2019 Preliminary Budget and Fiscal 2018, 2018 PMMR hearing. Today we will hear testimony from Commissioner O'Neill and his staff, followed by the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and lastly we will hear public testimony. Before we proceed, I would like to recognize members of the Public Safety Committee who are here today, Council Members Gibson, Cohen, and we're joined by Council Member Lanceman, and I'm not missing anyone else, right? The Department's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget totals $5.6 billion, an increase of less than 1% compared to the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. More than 90% of their budget supports personal services, while less than 10% supports other than personal services. The Department's budget supports a budgeted headcount of approximately 52,000 personnel, which includes 36,000 uniform, uniform personnel and 16,000 civilians. The budget reflects key initi initiatives, such as the expedited rollout of body-worn cameras to all officers on patrol by the end of 2018, additional tasers for officers, and an enhancement of the joint co-response teams with DOHMH as part of New York City SAFE. As this is my first budget hearing as chair of the Public Safety Committee, I'm looking forward to working with the department on numerous issues over the next four years, including improving budget transparency. Today, I hope to learn more about the department's new initiatives, its capital program, and the budget priorities for fiscal year 2019. As you can see, we have a lot to discuss today and a lot to consider, so let's begin. Welcome, Commissioner O'Neill, and we'll let you begin. Thank you for being here today, and please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Oh, sorry, and Beth is going to swear you in. Can you please okay. raise your right hand? Sure. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to council member questions today? I do. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the mayor's preliminary budget for the 2019 fiscal year. It's a pleasure to be here and to testify before the members of the council about the outstanding work the men and women of the New York City Police Department have been doing and continue to do around the clock every day and night. As such, I would like to thank the members of the NYPD's Aviation, Harbor, and Emergency Service Units and our SCUBA team for their quick and professional response to last night's tragic helicopter crash in the East River. Our immediate rescue and recovery work was a coordinated effort with the members of the Fire Department's Marine Unit, the U.S. Coast Guard, and a private tugboat. On behalf of all the first responders, I extend our condolences to the families of the five passengers who did not survive. We will now assist in every way possible the ongoing investigation by the Federal Aviation Administration and National Transportation Safety Board. When I testified before this body one year ago, we spoke about continuing to bridge the gaps where they still exist between the NYPD and the communities we serve, and about strengthening the fundamental notion that public safety is a shared responsibility. The underlying premise being building trust and earning the full and willing support of the people we serve is not only essential to safeguard New York City, it can also assist us in driving crime and disorder down beyond the record low levels we have already achieved. It is this crime-fighting approach that shapes our neighborhood policing philosophy, keeping New Yorkers safe, ensuring that they feel safe too. The bottom line is, we want the public to know that each of us has a stake in keeping all of us safe. Before highlighting some key budget items, I will update you on our core mission and several significant public safety initiatives. And I will be as brief as I can so our team can field as many of your questions as possible in the time we have available this morning. Just after the stroke of midnight on New Year's Day, we found ourselves truly in uncharted territory. The crime reductions New York City achieved in 2017 were categor categorically historic. The lowest per capita murder rate in nearly 70 years, the fewest shootings ever recorded in the modern era, burglaries, robberies, and auto thefts all down to levels we have not seen since the 1950s. Simply put, the city has not been this safe for three generations. And let me tell you, there were those who believed we would never be this safe. They assumed that more than 2,000 murders a year was just a price of doing business in New York City, that it was normal and nothing could be done about it. There were others, however, who refused to believe that who refused to accept that life in our city could not change for the better. Chief among these idealists were the hardworking men and women of the NYPD. But we are realists, too. We knew that reversing the decades-long trend of rising crime and violence would take time, and we knew that it would not be a solo effort. We understood that reclaiming our neighborhoods required the coordinated efforts of the entire police department in full partnership with all the people we serve. Let me be clear. 
Neighborhood policing is not a program. It is not an initiative. And it is not just a few cops in some parts of the city trying to be nicer to people. It is a philosophy intent, intended to reshape the approach to fulfilling our core mission, not only in an operational sense, but in the spirit and practice of every aspect of the work we do. Neighborhood policing reflects a cultural change for our entire agency, for every NYPD employee, uniformed and civilian, for every bureau, division, and unit, and for everyone who lives, works, and plays in New York. It is about each of us sharing responsibility for public safety by working to reduce violence together, all while building trust. And it's the most radical, top-to-bottom operational change the NYPD has embarked on in nearly 25 years. What we have learned in the NYPD is that we want everyone who lives in our communities tr to trust and respect our, our police officers, all of us in leadership roles, from the police commissioner's office on down to the frontline supervisors on the street. Also, have to trust and respect our police officers. We have to allow our men and women in uniform to be decision makers and problem solvers. We need them to take responsibility for and great pride in the people and areas in New York City they protect. And we need to treat everyone we serve equally and fairly. In short, this style of New York policing is a game changer for our entire profession. If you look back just two years, in 2016, we achieved historic lows across many crime categories, including the lowest number of shootings in the history of our city. 998. This was the first time that tally had ever been below 1,100, let alone under 1,000. But then in 2017, we pushed shootings down even further to 790. In 2018, year to date, shooting incidents are down about another 4.5 percent. Since 2013, they're down about 35.5 percent. And since 1993, they are down an incredible 88.5 percent. I really cannot overstate how remarkable this turnaround is for New Yorkers. The lives saved, the families kept intact. Overall crime is down in the patrol precincts, it is down in the transit system, and it is down in public housing. But at the same time that shootings and other violent crimes are being reduced year after year, NYPD police officers are also making thousands of fewer street stops, issuing thousands of fewer summonses, and making many, many fewer arrests. Meanwhile, we continue to lobby heavily against proposed legislation in Washington, D.C. that would undoubtedly bring more guns into New York. The Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act passed in the U.S. House of Representatives in December. The Senate version is still in the Judiciary Committee awaiting a hearing date. What it would do if passed and signed into law by the President is force all states to recognize concealed carry weapons permits from other states, regardless of how lax those state permitting laws may be. In fact, some states do not require gun owners to take any special training or to obtain a license or permit before carrying a concealed weapon. That is absolute insanity. And that lowest common denominator approach to gun safety would become the law of the land. It would effectively eviscerate state and city laws meant to keep people safe from gun violence and threatens to undo much of the incredible success we have achieved here in New York City. What does this all mean? Frankly, it means that achieving further declines in crime would get increasingly difficult with each passing year. But we are optimists at the NYPD, and we view this as both a challenge and an opportunity. That is why in 2018, we are redoubling our efforts to complete the NYPD's full conversion to neighborhood policing. To date, 56 of our 77 patrol precincts are neighborhood policing commands, plus all of our nine housing bureau police service areas. And this year, we will finish up the precincts and expand into all 12 of our transit districts. Some might wonder how we plan to apply the principles of neighborhood policing down in the subway system. I can tell you this, the same people use the same subway lines every day to get to and from work, to visit their friends and families, and to explore this great city. And even with the ridership of about 6 million passengers per weekday, it is not unreasonable to believe that individual officers can form bonds and build trust with many of those train riders. We're not going to meet everyone, of course, just as we will not be able to meet everyone up on the streets. But we have an obligation to try to foster these relationships and affect change. It can all begin with a simple smile and a good morning. And as NYPD cops go about their daily business of protecting New Yorkers, wherever it may be in the five boroughs, we are seeking to build that trust. We're now connecting in local neighborhoods in a way that simply were not possible before. And we have found that these partnerships speed and sharpen our entire investigative process. Information flows from neighborhood residents to teams of our sector cops, to the precinct detectives, and to specialty squads like gang and narcotics. Over the last three years, the relationships we have built with the public are leading to valuable information that becomes integral to the short, 
medium and long-term investigations we are conducting, literally hundreds of them a year. Our method of precision policing focuses now on the real drivers of crime. This means listening to New Yorkers and angling our investigative resources towards the relatively small percentage of our city's population that is responsible for the majority of our violence. Our laser-like focus on these specific individuals is further sharpened by the coordinated efforts of our patrol cops, detectives, and all of our local, state, and federal law enforcement partners. In these days, we are able to build stronger cases than ever because of our close ties with the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, the state police, the U.S. Marshal Service, and others. Some of our best work is done through the joint task forces we are on, which look at everything from bank robberies and so-called traditional crime to the evolving and ever-present threat of international terrorism. And some of our greatest partners in these matters are the city's five district attorneys and the U.S. attorneys for the southern and eastern districts in New York. With their assistance, many of these criminals are pre-indicted before we even knock on their doors to bring them in. Another enormous benefit of this level of collaboration is, what we, is that we see these cases all the way through to convictions and appropriate, meaningful prison sentences. This type of interagency cooperation is stronger right now than I've ever seen in, more, in my more than 35 years in law enforcement, and these partnerships are proving effective for all levels of crime. A week ago today, on Monday, March 5th, about 3.20 p.m., two of our Transit Bureau police officers were patrolling the Freeman Street Station in the Bronx, the two and five lines. They watched as a man jumped over the turnstile and tried to catch an uptown train. When the officer stopped the train, he violently resisted and was pepper sprayed. The officers called for backup, and as the struggle continued, $100 bills started to fall from the bag the man was carrying. In fact, it turned out he had $684 in cash on him at the time of the fare invasion. So why did all this occur? Why did the man not simply stop for the officers and after being properly identified accept the civil summons, which is essentially a $100 ticket payable to the MTA's Transit Adjudication Bureau? It happened because 35-year-old Randy Hayes had about 20 prior arrests in the Bronx and Manhattan on his record for offenses including robbery, assault, grand larceny, and theft of service. He was a transit recidivist and he had an open warrant. Also, the reason he needed to so quickly get on the train was because he had just robbed a Metro PCS store on Southern Boulevard. Detectives with our transit squad and our Bronx robbery squad interviewed the man and found this was hardly new behavior for him. Previously, he had been convicted and sentenced for a string of robberies in 2007 and was later released on parole. In 2014, when he violated that parole, he violently assaulted those arresting officers, too. When he was captured last week for his latest crime, NYPD detectives sat down with investigators from the ATF to further strengthen the case. Formed three years ago, the ATF NYPD Strategic Pattern Armed Robbery and Technical Apprehensions Task Force, or SPARTA, pursued high-profile armed robbery cases. And the great news is our alert transit police officers had just captured the criminal responsible for another pattern of commercial robberies committed in the Bronx in February. In each incident, the suspect displayed a knife or simulated having a gun in his pocket. And now, due to the man's criminal history and the fantastic cooperation between the NYPD and the ATF, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York is prosecuting him federally. Because of these partnerships, we are very confident Mr. Hayes will this time go away for a long time. I want to commend the Transit District 12 officers who made the initial stop, who made the initial stop last Monday for what they thought at the time was nothing more than a fair evasion but it turned out to be a remarkable arrest of a career criminal wanted for an open pattern of robberies. Cases like this further solidify our belief that we must always control access to the New York City subway system. And we will not shirk our responsibility to enforce quality of life offenses, including fare evasion. When we stop people for turnstile jumping or for sneaking in through the emergency exit gate, the most common outcome is a civil summons. Another partnership producing results is the one we share with the city's Department of Transportation aimed at reducing traffic fatalities as part of the mayor's Vision Zero initiative. In 2017, New York City had the fewest traffic deaths on record, driven by a 32 percent drop in pedestrian fatalities. This marks the fourth consecutive year of declining traffic deaths. Turning to budgetary issues, the NYPD plans to again pl apply for and obtain federal assistance to protect members of the public and critical infrastructure, including the financial district, the transit system, bridges, tunnels, and ports. Although we have already started planning for the federal fiscal year 2018 preparedness grant funding process, the applications guidelines for Homeland Security preparedness grants have not yet been released. 
Th that is because the federal government, including the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is currently operating under a continuing resolution until March 23, 2018. The timing of the fiscal year 2018 appropriation will significantly compress the time frame to announce and award these grants by September 30, 2018. Consequently, grant applications will have a much shorter application period than in recent years and potentially as short as several weeks. The NYPD relies on these funds to help protect all New Yorkers and visitors to our great city against terrorist attacks and to strengthen our homeland security preparedness. New York City, since the devastating 9-11 attacks, has been the target of 23 terror plots. These plots have included a suicide bomber in a subway passage beneath Times Square, the fatal truck attack on pedestrians and bicyclists along the West Side Highway, plans to place bombs among the festive crowds watching the July 4th fireworks over the East River, and an ISIS plot to behead a woman in Manhattan and to capture it on video. The federal homeland security funds buy us a lot, including our bomb squad's total containment vessel, the rolling vault that allowed the NYPD re to remove the live pressure cooker bomb planted on the street in Chelsea. The money also funds our vapor wake dogs that patrol large-scale events searching for hidden explosives and our active shooter training that hones the tactical skills of thousands of officers who might have to face a machine gun wielding attacker in a crowded concert venue or a school. Federal funds have allowed the NYPD to develop and sustain our sensor and information technology centerpiece known as the Domain Awareness System, or DAS, which supports the department's counterterrorism mission, hire intelligence research specialists, deploy officers to the transit system and other strategic locations citywide based on intelligence, and train officers to respond to chemical, ordnance, biological, and radiological threats or incidents, as well as active shooter scenarios. The NYPD also uses federal funds to purchase personal protective equipment for uniformed members of the service, and to purchase critical equipment that enhances our ability to protect New Yorkers and critical transportation and port infrastructure. Regarding the preliminary budget and its impact on the NYPD, the NYPD's fiscal year 2019 city tax levy expense budget is $5.2 billion. The vast majority of this, 92 percent, is allocated for personnel cost. Highlights in the preliminary budget include body-worn cameras, $5 million in fiscal year 2018, $12 million in fiscal year 2019, and $9.5 million in fiscal year 2020, and the out years will cover the cost of purchasing additional body-worn cameras, associated information technology upgrades, and the build-out of the space for the body-worn camera units in the risk management and information technology bureaus. As you are already aware, all NYPD officers and detectives on patrol will be outfitted with body-worn cameras by the end of 2018, a full year earlier than originally planned. Fair and impartial police training, funding in the amount of $1.1 million in fiscal year 18 and $4.5 million over the next two years was provided to initiate implicit bias training for all uniformed personnel. Co-response teams and triage. An additional 27 uniformed officers will expand the department's current deployment of co-response teams for citywide coverage seven days a week. Conducted energy device expansion, funding in the amount of $3.1 million in fiscal year 18 and $7.3 million in fiscal year 19 was approved for extended distribution of CEDs commonly known as TASERS. Over the next two years, the department's supply of CEDs for patrol officers will increase by more than 7,000. Currently, more than 16,000 of our patrol officers are trained. In the next 10 to 12 months, all of them will be trained. In the interim, our goal by the end of this month is to have at least one CED trained officer assigned to every patrol vehicle that answers 911 calls citywide. The Police Department's capital commitment plan contains $1.97 billion for fiscal years 2018 through 2022. In this plan, the NYPD was able to secure an additional $71.1 million over and above the last capital plan. Highlights of capital funding include new 40th Precinct Station House, $6.1 million in additional funds provided in order to proceed with construction. As you know, three years ago, this administration began addressing an important NYPD priority, the major rehabilitation or complete replacement of department facilities. Funds have already been allocated for the design and construction of a new 40th Precinct Station House in the Bronx, which was built in 1924. It's in very poor condition and cannot be rehabilitated. I'm pleased to report to you that the design for the new 40th Precinct Station House has been completed. 
and we now expect a construction contract award later this spring. It is important for me to note as well that we will be the that will be the uh, that this will be the first precinct built that incorporates community space in which residents and workers from neighborhoods can engage directly with the police officers who serve them. 127 Pennsylvania Avenue Community Center, 3.7 million. An additional EDC funds was provided based on revised cost estimates. NYPD is in the preliminary stage of construction for the portion of this building in Brooklyn that will be devoted to the community center. Construction is complete on the section of the building that will be used by the NYPD Community Affairs Bureau. In order to seek a qualified vendor to design, implement, and administer programming for the neighborhood residents of East New York, the NYPD published a request for proposal for community center programming. Proposed activities will be age and developmentally appropriate and will be geared, geared to promote well-being, foster a sense of social connection and belonging, and reflect this, this, the distinctive needs and interests of the community. Programming will be offered after school during the academic year as well during business hours in the summer months. Activities will be centered on athletic development, health and fitness, academic en enhancement, life skills, career awareness, school to work transition, civic engagement, community building, and culture and art. The interview process for selecting a qualified vendor is ongoing. The construction of phase one was completed in October 2017. The phase two construction for the community space is anticipated for mid-2019. Information technology, 53 million provided for body-worn camera infrastructure as well as hardware to support the domain awareness system, DAS. Across our department, we will continue to leverage every tool available to us to keep New York City safe, including the use of new and innovative technology. We are keenly focused on technological advances and how they can be applied to fighting crime creating safer and more efficient ways for police officers to do their jobs and contributing to the important work of building trust. As such, our footprint in social media continues to expand. In order to share timely and important information directly with the public, the NYPD currently operates 127 Twitter accounts with more than 1 million total followers. We have one Twitter account for every precinct, police service area, and many chiefs and specialty units. We also maintain 58 separate Facebook accounts, including 55 for neighborhood policing commands, one for the recruitment section and one for the cadet corps. Additionally, we run three Insta Instagram accounts and one Snapchat account, plus an external NYPD website, a very popular blog at nypdnews.com, and our own YouTube channel. Our goal, of course, is to further engage with all New Yorkers while il illustrating how Neighborhood policing touches everything we do. It is important to remember that it is not just about so-called traditional crime anymore. Each of our partners is also a critical ally in countering the ever-changing and perpetual threat of terrorism here in New York, our nation's principal target. And that important work continues around the clock for vigilant New Yorkers and for the NYPD alike. Our critical response command works 24 hours a day protecting sites and infrastructure around the city. Cops in our strategic response group are at the ready to rapidly respond to any emerging threat, be it an active shooter situation or other terrorist incident. Along with our emergency service unit cops, they are all informed by our first-rate intelligence bureau, which continues to be the industry leader in detecting, deciphering, and responding to a very fluid threat stream. Building trust with people we serve, fighting traditional crime, combating international terrorism, none of this is easy, but cops do not take these jobs because they are easy. People join the police department to make a difference, to do good, and NYPD cops accomplish that every single day. They are doing it in newer and better ways every day, too. As we consistently drove down crime over the years and achieved what many said was unachievable, making New York the safest big city in America, we did so sometimes at the expense of vital support in the communities we swore to protect. We did so sometimes in ways that inflamed old wounds, especially among people of color. It is now our mission to not reinflict those old wounds and to do all we can to help them heal again. To gain through partnership a new level of public support and public action that achieves our common mission of public safety. In my view, our two most important goals are these. Members of every community should feel they are understood by their police and know they are treated fairly. When we have achieved that, the NYPD will have achieved real trust. And we need civilians to view cops through a lens of trust because frankly, we need their support. Community engagement has always been key to crime fighting. But over the years, that fact was somewhat lost. There's no better time than now to rectify that, and I think we are well on our way. We continue to make sure our workforce reflects the communities we serve. 
We are a majority minority police department and we constantly work towards furthering diversity and inclusiveness at every rank. Members of the NYPD are now policing with the people of New York rather than just for them. The relationships we are fostering with the people who live, work, and visit here allow us to tailor our crime reduction and prevention strategies to individual neighborhoods, and that makes all the difference. Couple that with enhanced training, upgraded equipment, and the newest technology, and you can see how the best cops in the nation are able to constantly improve year after year. We are now holding regular neighborhood meetings, not run by executives or precinct commanding officers, but by patrol-level cops, the same cops, the people who live and work there, interact with every day. The NYPD is saying we need to build and strengthen this relationship. The first step has to be taken, acknowledgement. We are willing to see and hear the truth, and we are willing to act on that truth. It is about transparency and building trust between all of us. The second step requires people in every community to interact with their police. That can mean talking with a cop on the street or simply calling 911 when they see something that does not look or feel right. What a great next step is to, to attend these small neighborhood meetings. People can look up the time and place for their next local meeting at buildtheblock.nyc. We want everyone to have input as to what happens in their neighborhoods, and we need everyone to be part of the solution. And New Yorkers are responding. Since our announcement of Build the Block last spring, more than 650 police officer-led meetings have been held in more than 51 precincts, and about uh, 10,500 engaged New Yorkers have attended. While violence certainly remains at the forefront of conversation, the top concerns raised by attendees at these meetings include drug sales and use, trespassing and loitering, homelessness, traffic congestion, and noise complaints. This shows us that the NYPD continues to do the right thing in addressing quality of life concerns in every neighborhood. We know policing is a profession that must change with the times. And when it comes to New York policing, if we are not innovating and evolving, we are not moving forward. Through this mass massive paradigm shift in our operations, we now have almost all of our detectives reporting through the same chain of command. This unified investigations model encompasses traditional precinct detective squad work, plus narcotics, vice, warrants, our gun violence suppression division, and much more. It is those detectives, along with our field intelligence officers and our neighborhood coordination officers, who are honing in on the most troubled locations in the city. And we look for local members of the community to assist us, because we know that no one knows better what is happening on a given block than the people who live and work there every day. Soon, every police officer will be working closely in some way with community members to identify problems specific to their neighborhoods, to develop intelligence about crimes, and to lead problem-solving and crime-fighting efforts. This is how trust is earned. This is how lasting, productive community ties are built. And, we sometimes, and when we sometimes fall short, we need to quickly, decisively, and transparently correct the issue. Most people in our society are basically honest, and most police officers are more honest than that. But we recruit from the human race, so we know that some of the people we hire are not entirely honest, and we have built-in systems to find them and to discipline them. Anytime, anything that undermines trust is counterproductive and contrary to our goals. I've read some of the recent news stories about the NYPD and our disciplinary process, which seem to leave out many important facts. Let me give you one example. The online story about dismissal probation suggests that we put members on notice, and that is the only penalty. Dismissal probation, however, is a condition after charges have been brought and penalties have been levied. These penalties can involve loss of pay for 30 days or more and result in the loss of thousands of dollars in pay. Only then does the condition apply that officers can be immediately fired without any process if they commit additional violations. Government is a difficult business in which to fire people, but I am willing to compare the NYPD's disciplinary process and the number of people the NYPD terminates with any other agencies. Agency, we take our jobs, our integrity, and the trust of people we have given us extremely seriously. In closing, I can tell you this city is in much better shape today than it was when I became a cop in 1983. Those of you who lived and worked here 25 to 35 years ago know it too. This is not the same city it was in the 1980s and 90s. And each year, we are making even more headway. But we need everyone's help, everybody's effort, if we're going to increase those gains. Together, we are proving that New York City is the place that others across the nation want to emulate. As we, re we redefine the role of NYPD police officer, officer and, in essence, redefine what it means to be an engaged member of our society, we all have a unique opportunity right now to set the tone for the rest of the United States. Perhaps the most important reason for our city's turnaround on crime is our collective understanding 
that public safety is the foundation of everything we do. Here in New York City, we are proving that when the public and the police work together, we can make positive, lasting change in our society. That change begins when people are safe, and it is sustained when they feel safe, too. Throughout the tremendous changes we are undertaking in the NYPD, we have had the Mayor's full support, and we have benefited from the City Council's support as well. Thank you for your ongoing partnership and assistance and for everything you do to help us build a better and stronger police department. I'm very optimistic about the future of the NYPD and the direction we are heading. As the overall decrease in crime so far this year shows, we can police the city effectively without intruding unnecessarily or excessively into the lives of residents, businesses, and visitors. I believe the same is true of our mission to defend New York City from another terrorist attack. In my experience, there is a direct correlation between the level of community support for the police and success in fighting crime and terror. We will continue to work tirelessly to earn the trust and confidence of all New Yorkers and to ensure that there are even better days ahead. And we'll do so in a way that optimizes officer safety. This is all part of New York policing in 2018. The police do not underestimate the change even one person in our great city can affect, and neither should the public. Everything we do is geared toward embracing our differences and celebrating our common traits. I look forward to working with each of you as we make our way forward together. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify this morning. At this point, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And we're joined uh, by Council Members Power, Do Powers, Deutsch, Brannon, Williams, Cabrera, Valone, and Menchaca. And I want to thank you for your uh, testimony uh, this morning. I want to start off uh, speaking a little bit about capital investment. So let's start with uh, Rodman's Neck facility. Can you share with the committee the progress of the renovations at this facility? Sure. Deputy Commissioner uh, Vinnie Grippo, we'll talk about that. So um, do you want me to state my name or is that? Okay. Yes. Uh, Vincent Grippo, Deputy Commissioner of Management and Budget. Um, Rodman's Neck, as you know, we have $275 million that have been, uh, that are in the budget for the renovation of that facility. Um, we are right now in the process of, of beginning the design on that uh, facility. Now, one, one important measure that we have advanced uh, that we know is of interest to the council is sound mitigation. So the very first phase of the design, we've asked them, uh, they should be on board in, in around the May timeframe. We've asked them to look at sound mitigation um, during the construction process at the ranges, which as you are also aware, will have to remain active for a significant portion of that construction. The design consultant will, will be looking at that so that we can put those design measures in place um, over the coming months. So we would, we would view that time frame being late summer, early fall, um, where we would have temporary sound mitigation in place. The overall timeline, the design should take approximately a year. So beginning in May, it will run um, until sometime mid-2019. And then we anticipate construction, again, understanding that there's significant amount of work that needs to be done there to deal with uh, utilities, to deal with flood mitigation. Then we have to deal with keeping the range active for as long as possible. We anticipate a construction schedule of approximately five years. Wow. And do you think design build could be helpful in expediting uh, this particular project? We've looked at it. Um, ultimately, uh, because of some of the work that's already been done, we think um, it may be less of a candidate, but we haven't completely ruled it out. We have some other facilities. So you're speaking to the to state? DDC and to the mayor's office. Okay, yes. and to the mayor's office. Uh, and do you think $275 million is enough now? Someone who uh, recently, as you know, visited the site, I can attest that our officers deserve a much better facility when it comes to uh, training. Should we be asking for more money to ensure that uh, this particular facility is, can provide a better quality of life uh, for the officers that uh, so deserve it? So we undertook a CPSD process, which was a preliminary design process to assess the cost. Based off of the CPSD, we at the department are comfortable with the 275 million. The one disclaimer is whenever we go through now the official design, there are times that we come out of that process and we've identified additional costs. I can assure you that the department uh, is going to ensure that 
all of those facilities are modernized and replaced. Including the bathroom? Including the bathroom, which actually we're looking at trying to get something done as an interim measure along with the sound so we can uh, improve the bathroom conditions there now. Okay. I'm going to go into the crime lab in Jamaica. Uh, there are some horrendous conditions, and this is where most uh, uh, where lab is, crimes, uh, labs uh, obviously happen, DNA and other things happen. Um, can you speak to investment to this facility? Because we've been hearing a lot about the condition it's in, whether it's drinking water and leaks. So can you speak to any capital investment and a list of projects that are going to go on there to ensure that the place we process DNA and other things uh, can live up to its potential? So there's uh, two paths on this. One, we have a list of capital projects we would initiate if we can't go with the bigger plan, which would include a new roof, a new facade to deal with some of the flooding and some of the issues that we have there, brand new elevators, new boilers, um, and replacement of the AC systems. However, in light of your concerns, and, and we've preliminarily looked at uh, a number of facilities. This ranks fairly high in being a facility okay. that may need to be either replaced or undertake a gut renovation. So over the coming um, next several weeks, we're going to be looking at that, and we can follow up with your office. We'll so there's some the things way. you can do in the interim yep. until, okay. Um, going to go into one last question, and this is just on quality of life. So obviously the NYPD has make it, made a concerted effort to diversify its ranks, including a $54 million advertising campaign. Um, but one of the things we're seeing is the force diversifies a whole lot more. There seems to be a larger pay gap happening in comparison to other police departments. Uh, can you go into where we're at with pension discussions and salary? Uh, and what is the department looking to do, especially as we diversify the ranks, to ensure that officers who are now coming in would have uh, a better uh, pension and, and perhaps better pay and benefits? So, I mean, I'll, Don't all sing at once. <laughs> Ultimate, ultimately, I think we, have to, we work with the unions through the labor process um, to deal with things like salary compensation uh, and benefits. So um, obviously, we have similar interests in ensuring that our cops have what they need from a salary perspective that's competitive with other areas uh, as well as a benefits pro pro package. But that all is done in negotiations with the unions. Yeah, that's, uh, the, the unions are now in the process of collective bargaining. So we want to make sure that in the coming years that we have a police department that's motivated and, and uh, a big part of that we understand is, is through compensation. Now, there are a lot of other benefits uh, that uh, come to NYPD officers, but we fully understand that there's got to be equality as, as, as the years right. go by. And you do understand, as yeah. you know, the importance of ensuring this happens so that we can retain quality officers. Without a doubt. And not lose them to Suffolk County and Nassau and, and other places that, we, that we're seeing. We don't want to put people through our six-month <laughs> training program just to lose them to another agency. Yeah. 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 Um, let's go on to body-worn cameras. So in your testimony, we were a little taken aback at the $53 million price cap here. Can you go into the difference? Um, so how much of it is expense? How much of it is capital? So you've got plenty of volunteers to talk about body-worn cameras. Yes. I know this is one of your favorite subjects. I'm Jessica Tish. I'm Deputy Commissioner of IT at the NYPD. Um, the $53 million actually isn't all for body cameras. There were two numbers that were clumped together body cameras and our domain awareness system. So in terms of body cameras, um, on the, we, we have a number of programs that are underway to support it. We have to upgrade our network. We got $1.2 million um, for that. Two We're, million, you said? 1.2 million oh, 1 okay. for that on the capital side. Mm -hmm. Those are the only, in FY18, those are the only costs associated, uh, the capital costs associated with body cameras on the capital side. On the expense side, um, we got $8.3 million in fiscal year 19. That's for the expense related to storing the video, provisioning the cameras, et cetera. 
um, and then $500,000 for an upgrade in our connection to the cloud. So those are really the um, costs associated with the body cameras. It's nowhere near the $53 million. The 50, most, the majority of the $53 million was associated with upgrades for our domain awareness system. Okay, and how are you working? So I know the DAs are going to testify a little later and, and we've heard certainly from a lot of them. Uh, there's some concerns of how uh, effective network sharing will be. So can you go into how we're gonna ensure that um, we're working with the district attorneys who are gonna have to look at a lot of this. Body sure thing. So, and, and what investments are we looking at to ensure that you know, we can coexist together in a way? Sure, so the DA's offices have all been set up with access to our body camera application from which the DA's can view um, the body camera footage that we share with them because it is of paramount importance to us to secure all the videos so that we don't suffer from data loss or, or hacks. It's all done um, on the NYPD's network so we don't open it up just to the internet at large. So we run virtual private network connections between the NYPD and each of the district attorney's offices so that they can securely access the body camera footage and we don't expose ourselves to unnecessary data loss. Right, but I, I would just suggest, and I don't know if you're speaking to them, but to start conversations if they're not having, ha if you're not having them. Oh yes, we work right. with each of them uh, hand in hand to address any issues or concerns that they have. Can you go through transparency? So one of the questions is, and I know the press has a lawsuit, um, and one of our concerns is that um, obviously when it comes to this footage that I believe the commissioner will be the one who determines if this footage is released. So can you go through how we're going to ensure transparency? Uh, because one of the reasons obviously body cameras are, are in need is to ensure that there's protection, one for officers but for communities uh, as well. Uh, but one of our concerns is that in the case of an event, who determines uh, whether that footage would be released, right? Yep. Uh, is there some sort of independent body, whether it be CCRB or, or someone else you're thinking of who can uh, objectively look at the footage and determine outside of the department or working with the department whether footage should be released? I, 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 uh, Mr. Chairman, I already made a statement that whether it's you know, good, bad, or inconclusive, that we would release it. It's just a, a matter of working with the uh, whatever district attorney is involved to make sure that that process is done fairly. But uh, um, Larry Byrne, our Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, can maybe talk about it a little bit more. Good morning, Lawrence Byrne, Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters at the NYPD. So um, there are a number of issues at play here with regard to release of body camera footage. Uh, we have both the state FOIL law, which we comply with, which allows disclosure and prevents disclosure of certain issues. And then we have um, our own policy where there have been critical incidents of great public concern. And we've released uh, very recently, for example, footage and a number of recent police-involved shootings. We're in the process of developing an internal policy, which we will then publish, okay. about when and how the police commissioner will distribute that in a timely fashion, consistent with the concerns of district attorneys and our detectives who are conducting investigations, and consistent with the many privacy interests that are implicated by those caught on body camera footage. And ha uh, when, do, when can we anticipate those protocols? To be we have an internal public? working group, and I'm hoping in the next you know, 30 to 45 days, the police commissioner will approve a final policy. And you won't be working with any external group? No, but it's part of uh, every phase of our body camera program, including when we first uh, uh, deployed the pilot system, we've spoken with external stakeholders, including the district attorneys, including some of the civil rights advocacy groups, including our own unions and members of the public, and we'll continue to do that. Okay. And it's uh, just, we've, we've released the last, last four out of our five uh, officer-involved shootings have been captioned on body-worn cameras, and they've all been released. Right, but it's still just in a name, and no offense to yeah, you, I, got you know, I think you're I'm doing a offense. phenomenal job, and I think, you know, obviously you're, you're trying to, to be more transparent, but even looking to future administrations, whether you're, they keep you on as commissioner or not, we wanna ensure 
that right. the next administration also yep. follows Got a protocol as well. So that's why it's so important to get it out um, early. Let's go through NCO officers. So, um, so just speak about rollout. When do we anticipate uh, every precinct to have NCO rollouts? Um, and can you speak to how are you measuring? What are the metrics um, that determine if your NCO program is successful within local? Right, so, uh, Chief of Department Terry Monahan is going to talk about it. He'll give you an overview. And then uh, Rodney, Chief Harrison, our Chief of Patrol, can talk about some of the specifics. All right, so we're going to be rolling out uh, by the October of this year. Every precinct will be working under the neighborhood policing philosophy. So every command, there are 20 commands left. So all of them will be up by, uh, by the end of the year. And then uh, we started with transit districts. Two transit districts will start within, uh, within the next month, and they'll be up, and we're looking to roll through that, hopefully by uh, the end of this year or early next year, to have each of our transit districts up. Can you speak to how to metrics? So how do you determine if this program is really doing what it's set out to do? And how do you know that the particular NCO sectors that you have are actually doing uh, the job that they're they're supposed to do. Okay, so good morning. My name is uh, Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol. If I could just uh, uh, piggyback off what the uh, Chief of Department was saying. Uh, we're rolling out uh, seven commands in April, uh, the 1st, the 5th, the 5 the 6 the 105, the 111, and the 121. They'll be all up and running by, by April 2nd. So some of the metrics that we take a look at uh, regarding uh, each precinct, as well as the as well as the steady sector, we have a, we have a couple things in place. Of course, we take a look at um, the reduction in, in in crime in each one of the sectors, and we make sure that there there's an appropriate deployment plan for each one of those sectors. We also have a uh, sentiment meter that we are, are utilizing uh, to kind of see if uh, if there's a uh, concern regarding safety. Or, or if there's a, a happiness with the community residents regarding each sector within the, uh, within the neighborhood policing precincts. So uh, those are just one of the two uh, ways we, we've analyzed and evaluate the success of failures, as well as uh, speaking to focus groups, as well as uh, community leaders, um, uh, trying to see if they have any input regarding the neighborhood policing within their areas to see if they're uh, happy or content with it, and we'll also open up the, the, the floor to uh, suggestions as well. Uh, we have build a block meetings with each one of our uh, NCOs. They have uh, one meeting each quarter of the year, and they uh, promote it and try to get a nice, robust attendance at the event. These are other uh, ways we evaluate the complaints that come in and make sure that there's an immediate response from the NCOs regarding how they're handle, handling some of the conditions that come up in the, within these meetings. And I, I guess what I'm trying to dibble into a little bit is how are we, are we positive that NCOs are reaching, not just civic associations, the, the individuals who are heavily engaged in civic infrastructure across New York City, but how are they meeting everyday New Yorkers and how do you, you know, look at those metrics? There, there's, uh, we're, we are working on finishing up a, an app. As you know, every police officer has a smartphone. Okay. We'll be able to track uh, the build a block meetings and whatever other community or business tenant association meetings they go to. And in that app will be contained uh, what the problems were that were identified and, and how those were solved. So we're going to, that'll give us a good sense of who the NCOs are meeting with. We understand that uh, NCOs are one of the most important positions in the police department uh, moving forward. Uh, they have to be the people out there on the front line helping us build trust. So. The, the, uh, not only do the precinct commanders select the NCOs, Chief Harrison personally looks at each and every one of them that are selected to make sure that they're the right person for the job. And we know it's got to be it's got to be everyone in the community, not just certain segments of the community. Okay, well, we're going to look to look yep. much deeper into this as we yep. move forward. But we understand you're rolling out, and we commend the NYPD for certainly yep. um, doing this. I'm going to dibble into just a few more questions before we get to my colleagues. Uh, I want to go into civilianization a little bit. Um, okay. So in a recent report provided to the council, the department identified nearly 480 positions that could be civilianized. Um, can we speak to what is the plan uh, this year to ensure that we reach that number? 
So uh, first what I'll do, we, we had a civilianization program that was funded, uh, as you know, two years ago, 415 positions. We're down to only five positions at which we need to recruit. So that, that program was extremely successful. Of that 480, uh, those 480 positions, we think the next group of positions that are ready to be civilianized is approximately 335 positions. But I would state also that we are looking at more comprehensively beyond the report that we're required to submit to the City Council. Now that we've done uh, enhanced civilianization at the department over a number of fiscal years, uh, we have our Office of Management Analysis and Planning doing a more comprehensive review to see what the true final number is. So I think um, that 480, we may come back ultimately with a different number. And how could we partner with you on this? Is there anything we can do to be helpful here? Ultimately, I think in, in many instances, the, the, the City Council has been extremely helpful in advocating for us to pr continue to get civilianization positions. And ultimately, I think we share the same goal here, which is to ultimately get as far as we can in this, because we're, every, every position that we civilianize means another officer reassigned back to patrol, mm -hmm. which is helping enhance the neighborhood policing <coughs> program. Okay, so and when can we anticipate you getting back to us? or they're being, you know, so uh, when, do, when can we anticipate these 335 positions actually being filled? Well, I do, we, we have to work, we're working on that with both the city council and the mayor's office. Okay, um, but more of a, a timeline would be good as we move forward. Uh, I'm gonna go into school safety quick. So obviously, I mean, a speaker uh, who cannot be here today is called for um, uh, auxiliary officers to be outfitted with bulletproof vests, obviously. You saw yesterday, I'm sure. Commissioner, you read in the post. All right, I was joking. He didn't, he didn't catch it. Um, but uh, we want school safety agents to obviously be outfitted with bulletproof vests. Can you speak to your thoughts on that? Is this something the department is willing to entertain? I'm also interested in knowing um, what is the department doing around school safety? We know this is not Florida, um, but there has been an uptick in school crime, um, and I'm interested in knowing what uh, is the department doing, how are you partnering with the DOE? And we understand we can't right. militarize our way out of this situation, and we don't want to do that, but we want to hear a little bit more around the plan of school scanners. Um, have you reevaluated your strategy around that now? How are you gauging the school community in particular on safety? and if they feel safe and, and what warrants a pro, uh, different protocols to ensure they do feel safe in that case, in a case if they're not. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit more about staffing as well sure. and how are we ensuring that our schools are, are really being covered in a way. Um, prevention is the best cure always. So uh, how are we uh, Chief for Brian Conroy is with me. He's the chief of school safety. But just at, as far as bullet resistant vest for uh, school safety officers, we are I'm in support of that, and we are working with uh, the, the people necessary to get that done. Some of them being in the unions, so we are we are supportive, and we're looking we're looking to get that done. We're trying to keep school safety officers uh, as safe as possible. And um, just lastly, while I have you, so I think Trump today has said he's he's obviously dangling some dollars, federal dollars, at um, states that uh, are willing to train teachers to be armed. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I I, I think. Uh, if you read the Daily News, not the Post, <laughs> you know you know what my comment. Was. I read both. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so do I. Uh, there, uh, uh, teachers need to teach. Uh, this is the job of law enforcement uh, to to help uh, to keep the children protected. So uh, that's that's my position. So we won't be entertaining any of those. Not as it, not as it seems right now. But you know we're we're always open to to think about new things. But. Uh, you know, uh, many conversations I've had with my executive staff, uh, that's not the direction we're looking to go in. Brian? Uh, Brian Conroy, uh, commanding officer of the School Safety Division. As you mentioned, we, uh, we had an increase of crime, but only during the fourth quarter of the calendar year of 2017. So as we stand now, we're down 8% in, uh, in major crimes. And over the January and February, we're down 27%. So. That fourth quarter was troubling for us, but we did institute some plans into effect uh, 
and we've seen a, a good turnaround. We're always monitoring it, and we'll always uh, keep our eye on school crime. Uh, but so far, we're doing very well. And just to point on top, uh, last school year was the lowest crime in, in schools since we started, since the NYPD took over school safety in 1998. But it has been reported there's been uh, more weapons being confiscated. Is, that, is there truth in that? Or, or Yes. No? Over the last several years, we've seen uh, an increase in the number of weapons recovered during the schools. Uh, we think we're doing a real good job at uh, intercepting weapons before they get into the schools. Uh, so on that's a positive, it's negative, of course, that uh, students are carrying weapons, and we're working very closely with the Department of Education to come up with educational programs to uh, discourage that, and talking to students also to find out, you know, what's the reasons why they're carrying weapons, and try to make sure that they feel safe uh, inside the schools. And the mayor has called for, I believe, active uh, shooter drills. We do we do drills within this within the schools. Uh, the schools are required to do drills not only for, it's not active shooter drills, there are more okay. incidents if you have mm -hmm. uh, fire drills, we do lockdown drills inside school, and school safety works directly with the school staff on, on doing those. Um, we too are train our personnel on active shooter. Uh, our uniformed police officers uh, are trained on that, and also our civilian agents are also trained on what to do if there is a, a circumstance with an active shooter or other type of emergency. Now, we positive the all the schools are actually, and this is a question I think of race with DOEs as well, on coordination, are we positive uh, these drills are actually happening? And if not, you know, we should sort of get in a place where they are, right? Um, preparation is key to prevention, but also ensuring in the event of an incident that our kids are safe. Now we have measures in place um, that could prevent or help to minimize a tragedy from happening. So I haven't heard too much more on this, but interested in knowing, are you reevaluating uh, your partnership with DOE uh, in terms of ensuring that protocols are in place? We've had several discussions on that, and we've made suggestions, and they're very open to the suggestions that we have. We're also working very closely with our precinct uh, partners on this, and particularly the NCOs and the precinct sectors, about increasing the uh, uh, level of patrols in, in the vicinity of precincts, also in the vicinity of our schools, also to uh, increase that level of safety around the schools. Okay, I'm going to go to my last. These are I'm going to group these questions together, and then I'm going to get to my colleagues, and then I'll come back around because I think we have you to noon. Um, so obviously, we've been looking at marijuana arrests and summonses, and obviously, I mean, I don't have to read the figures again, but 86 percent of summons and arrests were in communities of color, and I'm interested in knowing from the department on why we're prioritizing uh, these marijuana arrests at such high levels. Is this the department's priority? Um, are we looking at reevaluating um, why communities of color are being targeted uh, at this particular level? Do you find it troubling? Um, so I'm interested in engaging and hearing a little bit more uh, from you on how we're going to correct this. So we have to be responsive to community concerns, and I was lucky enough to be a precinct commander in, in NYPD for a little over six years. I worked in the 2-5, uh, which is in East Harlem, and I worked in the 4-4 in the South Bronx. And if I did not engage in quality life enforcement, I would not have been a precinct commander for very long. So we do need to be responsive. I know there's been some articles in some of the, uh, the newspapers. Uh, Dermot Shea, our chief of crime strategy, is going to speak to that a little bit. But uh, you know, this, this is something that we need to do. I, I understand that there are disparities. There are reasons for it. Uh, there are reasons for it. And uh, Dermot can talk about that a little bit. And when he's done, we can engage in a little bit more. But I'm, I'm in commission. I'm just a little taken aback by your comments. You, so you acknowledge that there are disparities. That there, if if you look at it, that's that. You know, if you look at the stats, I'm, I'm not going to deny that. But you got to see the the whole body of work that we're doing here. Uh, right. And, and the question is, how are we going to fix those well, disparities? Well, the the question is, how are we going to continue to keep people safe in this city? Uh, you know, I go to uh, I ran Comstat for two years. Uh, we look at the minute level of detail of who we are arresting and why we are arresting them. And I'll let Dermot speak to that a little bit. But 
we really have to be careful here about, you know, what we're looking to do. Uh, there's been a great improvement in public safety over the last since since the 1994, actually before that, with uh, with Mayor Dinkins, a lot of great programs have uh, we, we've embarked on a lot of great programs. We've we went from listen in 1990 to, to 2,245 homicides to last year we had 292. So you make an correlation. I understand, I understand the issue between marijuana and I, murders. And it's just okay. it is part of uh, of our strategy is to conduct quality of life enforcement. And we need to be responsive to the people of this city. And we're going to talk, uh, Dermot's going to talk about complaints and, and enforcement. And, and well, I'm sure we're going to continue the conversation. But uh, we, we, uh, we are trying our best to, 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 to move forward and to make sure whatever disparities exist in this in the city, we address them. But we also have to be mindful, very mindful, of, of strategies that change. How are they going to impact public safety. So and if you're going to read stats on 911 and 311, I don't believe there's a correlation. I think anyone who looks at the numbers knows, can very well see that there's no correlation between the two, that this is, there are certain commanders perhaps or certain precincts who are choosing to overly enforce to a great degree. And, you know, one example is Councilmember Lanceman and I looked at the 105th precinct, for instance, where you had 2,500 low-level marijuana uh, arrests and summonses, right, um, from 253 call calls. Then on the other hand, we looked at the 90th precinct, a majority white precinct in Brooklyn covering mostly Williamsburg, which received 451 calls but only had 300 arrests and summonses for marijuana. So what do you have to say to that disparity? And once again, just looking at the facts, everyone smokes marijuana on, at the same average. So the calls are not correlating between 911 and 311 data. And, the, and, that, and you can't change those facts. Um, that's a fact based on the analysis and numbers you gave us. So. So, Dermot, you want to just talk about yeah. uh, marijuana enforcement over the last couple of years? Sure, I'll just give a, a brief overview. Dermot Shea, Chief of Crime Control Strategies. <clears throat> I'll start with some positive news. Um, where we are now and where we've come from. 2011, the NYPD peaked with over 422,000 arrests. In 2013, we made over close to 394,000. We finished last year with 286,000 arrests. Um, we're down from that already this year, 10%. To me, from my view of the NYPD and the landscape in New York City, that's probably the most impressive piece of not just pushing crime down, but how we've done it with a significantly lighter touch. We've, over the last four plus years, instituted uh, numerous policies that have a direct correlation to achieving that. Whether you're talking about diversion of youth, diversion of adults, uh, working with our district attorneys to uh, most recently in Staten Island with the HOPE program, and now a different name, but also expanding that to Brooklyn. Whether you're talking drugs, whether you're talking marijuana, we've had discussions on peddlers, we've had discussions on people driving with suspended licenses across the breadth of the NYPD. Uh, that's how we've achieved a 32% reduction from the peak, and just in the last four years, nearly 27% in overall arrests. And to echo the police commissioner's uh, introduction, we've done that while we have now seen record crime last year, record homicides, and record shootings. That's the overall. Moving on to marijuana. Marijuana as a subset of the overall enforcement activity that we see. Our peak year was 2000, and we essentially had the same in 2011, between 51 and 52,000 uh, arrests for 221.10 criminal possession of marijuana. We do see fluctuations over the years. When you look at 2011 with nearly 52,000 arrests, by 2013 it had fallen to 29,000. By 2017, last year at the end, it's under 18,000. Right, but it's still 20,000 nearly a year. It, right? it's, so it's just under 18,000 last year, and we are down as we sit here today 1% very early in the year. 1% is not enough. 
So, so, so now I'll turn to and, and, and the reason we say this is because when the mayor came out and I definitely understand the level of arrest in, in moving into summonses, but summonses aren't that much better as well, right? Because if you end up in the court system for a warrant, it's almost penalizing someone for life, right? So, so uh, the question is why is this over enforcement happening in black and brown communities? And I don't want any, I mean, there are states looking at legalization. You have the governor who's just set up a task force on legalizing. What are you gonna do if it's legalized? And, and are these individuals' records gonna be expunged who are possibly ending up in prison over a low level offense? So we're gonna enforce the law. We, we would deal with that eventuality as it, when and if it comes, we'll enforce the law that's on the books. And then uh, in terms of any sealing, we'll, we'll consult with the, the appropriate attorneys within the department and outside to make sure our policies are in line with the law. Uh, I will point out, sir, that since 2013 to the, en to the end of last year, that's a f not that long ago, four-year period, when you look at 9-11 calls in New York City that mention marijuana, 48% increase. Um, this is the balance right. and that I, we are and trying I to gonna strike. Say, I, I knew you were going to say that. But when you look at the 911 calls and you look at the data from every precinct in the city, on average, they're all calling about the same amount. No, that's not, that's not accurate. We, we see wide disparities in the general Would you say that each precinct calls? at least has about 200 complaints? Some have many less, some have many more. We, we see a wide... Maybe one has less, maybe one or two. But on average, based on the data you provided us, unless I'm reading it wrong, every precinct in New York City I, has again, at least 200 this, this or more. Again, this is something um, no. that was spoken about before in, in terms of 9-11 data and 311 data in terms of marijuana-related calls. There are many factors that come into play, which was discussed at the prior hearing in terms of our hesitancy to turn over data, which can be run five different ways. So I'll, I'll be clear with the numbers I'm quoting now. This is not a subset of 9-11 calls. This is all 9-11 calls received in New York City over 2017 and then the full year 2013 and then querying that base of all 9-11 calls, not just certain types, for where the word marijuana spelled with a J, marijuana spelled with an H, and the word weed shows up. Somebody can come after me and probably add a couple different variables to that and get slightly different numbers, but any way you run it, there is a significant increase in the public calling the NYPD about conditions relating to marijuana. Okay, we could debate this, but I, I look forward to continuing to have this conversation. And just, um, just to jump in for a second, and uh, as you know, being on the council for, for many years, we are more than willing to engage uh, with the council to, to make sure that we are policing the city as fairly and as equitably as possible. So I appreciate sure we'll those words because yeah. that's, those are, you know, we want to see it in deeds because right now the data reflects something that is, I mean, you can make the correlation, people were using the same argument about stop and frisk, right? You know, we are stopping and frisking because more crime and more calls are coming. But we know that was BS. We know that there were communities of color who were being, uh, where there was a concentrated amount of stop and frisk happening. And, and I, I see this marijuana uh, issue very similar. And I don't know anyone who wouldn't who's looking at the data. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to my colleagues. Uh, uh, Councilmember Miller has joined us. I'm going to go to uh, first Councilmembers Lansman, Gibson, Cohen, and then Powers. <coughs> so we'll start with Councilmember Lansman. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Morning. And your team. Um, so since, uh, if I understand your testimony, something like 92% of the police department's budget is for personnel services, um, and since this council, in pushing for first 1,000 new cops, which ended up being 1,300 new cops, understands that part of reforming policing in the city means ensuring that we've got the appropriate number of police officers, that they are properly compensated, uh, trained, uh, et cetera. I, I want to focus on those issues. I'm going to start with, um, with an anecdote. 
I don't know if it's an anecdote, a little story. When, um, when Al Albert uh, Carvalho, the, our school's chancellor for a moment, was uh, hired, he, he was offered $345,000 a year salary, which was $118,000 higher than Chancellor Farina was getting, and the mayor was questioned about that. And the mayor explained that it was important for the chancellor's salary to be competitive with other school districts around the country. Specifically, he said, quote, in other cities around the country, including much smaller cities, the salary levels are much higher for the head of the school system. And then the mayor's spokesman, Eric Phillips, expanded on this point, saying that Carvalho's salary offer was, quote, in line with what big city systems are paying, and we wanted the best. So let's start with a, with a basic foundational question. Do you agree that police officers are entitled to the same standard at looking at other jurisdictions when it comes to setting their compensation? Uh, I agree that uh, police officers should be treated fairly and they should be compensated uh, at the rate. There's a couple things going on here that, and it has to be uh, what the city can afford to and they're in the middle of collective bargaining right now. So that's what they're trying to work out. Now I understand that, yep. that there are many factors that might go into it and we all agree that police officers should be treated fairly. But you've been a, you were a police officer long before you were uh, rose through the ranks and, and now a commissioner. Do you agree that one of the factors in, in determining what a New York City police officer should get paid should include looking at compensation in, in other jurisdictions? I mean, I mean, that's something that has to be looked at. Of course, we have to be paid fairly. And just to go back to the chairman's point, we just don't want to make sure that, that we're losing people to other police agencies. Mm -hmm. I know that, that the, being an NYPD cop means a lot to the 36,000 uniform members of the service, but they also have to be compensated correctly. I understand that. Okay. Um, as, as does my executive staff. I mean, as far as compensation. Sure. And, and I'm sure you're, you're aware of the tremendous disparity that exists May I have a few more minutes, Mr. Chair? The tremendous disparity that exists, even w between police organizations that operate in New York City. The data that I have, which I got from the Police Officers Union, has a 20-year average compensation of a Port Authority police officer making $115,000 a year, a state trooper in New York City making $112,000 a year, MTA officer making $101,000 a year, a New York City police officer, 20-year average, makes only $89,000 a year. And uh, it, f the data that I have indicates that, you talk about you know, keeping good police officers, there's been a significant increase in the number of resignations from the department. These are folks not who've reached their 20 or 25 years, but people who've left early. And that those, no, those numbers have gone up each year in the de Blasio administration. They've gone up 100% from the last year of the Bloomberg administration. And do you believe that better compensation in other New York City and nearby jurisdictions has played a role in these increased resignations? I, I'm going to ask uh, Chief Bill Morris, our Chief of Personnel. Bill, do you have, do you have those numbers? If not, we're going to have to get, to, uh, get them to you, and I'm going to have to take a look at it. Bill? Yeah, uh, I'm Bill Morris. I'm the Chief of Personnel. I don't have the figures with me about uh, resignations, but we can get them for you, and we can provide them. Well, I appreciate that. And if it's my understanding when folks resign, when cops resign, there's um, some kind of exit form. Yes, sir, there and, is. And that exit form indicates where they're going next, like if a cop is resigning to go to Nassau County or the, the MTA. Is that, is that indicated in their form and you have that data? Yes, sir. I, I sign every single one of them so we can provide right. that. Got it. We would like to get that data, obviously redacting officers' individual names, but just for an understanding of where people are going. But in terms of the resignations that are happening, whether there are more in the last few years or, or the same as it's always been, I think the data will show that there's more. Does the fact that other jurisdictions like Nassau County or even within New York City, the agencies that I mentioned, pay so much more than the NYPD does, is that a factor in folks uh, resigning from the NYPD and, and going to work in those jurisdictions? 
I think we'd have to uh, take a look at uh, at the, the data that we have and uh, the, the forms that Bill sees. But and I appreciate uh, Councilman uh, you acknowledging the value of uh, NYPD police officers. I've been a cop, although not a cop anymore, wearing that uniform for 35 years. So I appreciate what you're saying here. Uh, and my job as the police commissioner and the job of the executive staff is to make sure that uh, uh, we are we have a police department that is is motivated and we've asked them to do a lot over the last okay. three years specifically with neighborhood policing so uh, thank you thank you for for what you said uh, we are always looking to make sure that we are compensated properly and as I said before this is a matter of collective bargaining and in our, and are in that process right now all right last question um, my understanding is the offer that, that the city has on the table is 1.5% increase followed by for a period of time and then 1.75% increase, which obviously just mathematically isn't going to come close to getting our officers anywhere near parity. And that's kind of forced by the, by the pattern bargaining system. In your opinion as commissioner, the constraints that pattern bargaining imposes on the ability to, to raise cop salaries so that there's some parity with other jurisdictions. Do you think pattern bargaining really works when we're talking about cops? Yeah, I'm not, they're in the middle of, uh, I think, uh, mediation right now, possibly arbitration. So I, I don't want to com uh, comment anymore about the collective bargaining that's going on right now. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to go to Council Member Gibson, followed by her will be Cohen and Powell. I'm going to ask you, the Commissioner does have to leave at noon, so to really adhere to the three minutes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Richards, and good morning, Commissioner, to you and the executive team. It's always good to see you. Um, I want to thank you as well for your incredible response and efforts in yesterday's uh, horrific tragedy in the East River. Um, the work that the men and women of the NYPD do every day is remarkable, and certainly uh, we appreciate the work you've done. And since I have a time frame, I will just limit my remarks as best I can because I do have just several questions. Um, but on behalf of my colleague in the Bronx, uh, certainly the work we're doing, um, Mr. Grippo, on Rodman's neck is going to be very crucial. I am concerned about the five-year time frame that you alluded to. And without design build authorization, I certainly think that it uh, propels a further conversation because five years is certainly too long to wait for the complete uh, renovation and the noise mitigation for Rodman's neck. Um, I'm happy to hear about the work on the NCO rollout and the expansion to get to all of our precincts, our PSAs, and transit districts. I think that's great. Um, I wanted to ask quickly on two items. School crossing guards have always been my passion. Um, really appreciate the work that our school crossing guards do. Last year's budget, we added 200 new school crossing guards and 100 supervisors. So I wanted to find out where we are in terms of vacancies, um, the work we're doing with DOE to ensure that as new schools open, we're able to provide a school crossing guard with those particular schools. So I just before uh, Rodney answers that, I just want to acknowledge and thank you for your service as the former public safety chairperson. Thank you. That's Donovan, nothing. Nothing against you. <laughs> She's okay. much better. Just acknowledging that. I didn't say that. Did not say that. Did not say that. Okay. So, so okay. So. I had big hills to fill, as, as I said. <laughs> All right. So good morning once again. Uh, good morning. Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol. All right. So um, the, the budget uh, staffing for school crossing guards right now is at 2,638. Uh, we currently have... Uh, the number of 2,546, um, 67 of the school crossing guards are out military and extended leave, which um, leaves us a number of 25 that we need to hire. Some of the things that we're putting in place in order to rec um, recruiting efforts are to uh, develop the uh, online application development. Actually, we have it in place. We're going to right. help promote it. Uh, we're going to go to social media to make sure that we, we get the word out regarding the, the school crossing guards and the, uh, the flexibilities uh, that come along with it and distri distribution of material uh, at the commands um, uh, throughout, the, throughout the different precincts throughout the city uh, to once again get uh, a better uh, attempt to get more, more school crossing guards uh, to apply for the position. Uh, also, um, a retention. In 2016, we had 120 uh, resignations and in 2017 we had 118 resignations so that's a little concern that we have to kind of uh, tighten up as well 
Okay, and I'm certainly happy um, to join Chair Richards in working with you. Um, they are a very critical part of the work we do, and certainly we've made a lot of progress. Um, so I want to make sure that we can reduce uh, those numbers on attrition, and certainly the recruitment efforts, the social media, and all of the promotions are great. Um, I wanted to ask about crisis intervention training um, and the co-response teams. If I could ask that last question, crisis intervention, Deputy Commissioner Susan Herman has been doing a lot of great work meeting with organizations. Wanted to find out where we are on expanding CIT training to senior officers. Now that it's incorporated into the academy training, all of the new officers are getting CIT, but senior officers, uh, we're doing the small class size training. So I wanted to find out where we are in that. And the co-response teams, Commissioner, are happy to see that we're expanding and moving to citywide coverage seven days a week. Um, would that be 24 hours? And if you could expand on that as well. Good morning. Susan Good morning. Herman, Deputy Commissioner, Collaborative Policing. The as you know, we committed to training supervisors in the CIT training, and by the end of March, we will have trained all of the lieutenants in CIT training, and by summer, all of the sergeants. So that means that supervisors who are at the scene of an EDP incident will all have CIT training by the end of the summer, but lieutenants by the end of this month. Okay. We are going back to recruit training, and there will be in-service training as well. Okay, so we're alternating or is that happening simultaneously? It's happening simultaneously. Okay, and the co-response teams? Co-response teams are expanding to two tours a day, seven days a week, and the triage desk is expanding to seven days a week, three tours a day. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with you. You know I have more questions, but if there is a second round, I will certainly provide that. But really wanted to thank you all, and it's been an honor working with you the past four years. Um, certainly as a member of this committee, my commitment remains there on behalf of my beloved borough of the Bronx. Um, I want to thank you for your work to our city. Thank you, Chair Richards. Thank you. And just to follow up on school crossing guards, I think we need to reevaluate some things with DOE in terms of, for instance, they can't sit in the building, you know, uh, they can't go into a school building, I believe. So just on, a, I think we need to have a larger conversation around um, how we can improve the quality of life for them so that they could actually, uh, or maybe I'm misspeaking, I don't know yeah. if there have been some protocols that have been changed. Yeah, just if, if you don't mind, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, there have been some uh, changes or maybe information got out incorrectly. Uh, school crossing guards are allowed to go into schools. Uh, the one thing we do want uh, is for them to be out there during the, the times of arrival at the schools as well as dismissal. So we just want to, they're allowed to go in, but not during the, those uh, right. pr priority times. Uh, right. We, exactly. we would like for them to be on their post. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to Council Members Cohen, Powers, and then Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, I, too, want to say congratulations uh, on, on the record-setting crime reductions, and thank you to the men and women of the department for doing the hard work. Uh, I'm extremely appreciative and on behalf of all my constituents. Um, one thing that I am particularly concerned of, uh, part of I represent part of the 5-2 precinct, and uh, the opioid crisis is having a significant impact. And I also think it is sort of a and maybe a disproportionate impact in terms of people's perception of what's going on in the community. Uh, and and I, I'm the first to acknowledge that I think that the men and women in the NYPD sometimes have an untenable job, that I, I think that this is a public health crisis. But having people uh, ODing in our libraries and on our streets and in our parks uh, ultimately uh, it has an impact on the perception of crime. Could you talk a little bit about the resources needed to combat that and, and, and the response? And uh, Susan and Bob Boyce are, are going to help me with this answer, but this is something that, uh, you know, in, in, in 16, I, there were 1,400 ODs. There were two, you know, three, I think it was, uh, what was the number, 335 <coughs> homicides. Uh, in 17, I don't think we have final numbers yet, but I think it's up uh, 10 to 12 percent. So we understand that this is a serious health crisis, and it's, it, goes, and it goes beyond just the NYPD, and we are working with uh, uh, the administration in the city, and we're working with the council to make sure we do our best to reduce those overdoses. Uh, Bob can talk about what we're doing on the enforcement side, and, and Susan can talk about uh, the other issues that we're contending with. So, so good morning. Uh, one of the things we did about coming up on two years ago was embark on a, on, a, on a plan to reduce distribution networks of heroin and fentanyl. The mix is what the, what the issue is here. Um, 
by adding 82 police officers to our narcotics division. We also added another 20, <coughs> out of that, I'm sorry, out of that 82, 20 into interdiction programs, interdiction task forces. In that time, um, and it's just not a police issue at all, Susan will tell you what, what we're doing as well, but we do have a role, and we've accepted that role. So in that time, we've uh, uncovered uh, uh, record levels of heroin coming in from Mexico and fentanyl coming in from China. That combination is what's creating this issue. Uh, what was once a 10% purity is now 60%. The human body cannot take that, uh, and that continues. So we're fighting the fight. We've done casework uh, time and time again in, uh, in specific areas as well as all over the city. The Bronx, sir, is what you're talking about, and that is the number one um, uh, area for overdoses in New York City. Uh, aggregate number. Uh, per capita, it's Staten Island, but it's shared throughout the city for the most part. Uh, the one with the least is actually Queen South. It's still an issue there. So we've sent our people, deployed these resources throughout the city according to where that's happening. Uh, we also have Twitter posts out to warn people. Uh, when we have a stamp that killed someone, we put that out as well to make sure that everybody gets the word. So I think last year we did over 600 kilos. We recovered over 600 kilos of heroin uh, and fentanyl, which we hadn't recovered at all. We're now doing it as well. Our big fear is that it will get to the uh, gangs and uh, this will create violence. So far, that hasn't happened. Uh, so we do this every day. We've embarked on something that no other police department has done in the country. <clears throat> we respond to every overdose that happens, whether fatal or saves, and start a case from that uh, overdose. Uh, and that's how we've uh, <clears throat> disrupted these networks, <clears throat> by gathering evidence at that and then giving it to a narcotics officer to further the case. We have taken down a lot of networks. We still have more to do. Uh, but that's where we are right now as, uh, as far as uh, attacking this from a police standpoint, from an enforcement standpoint. I'll let Susan Herman tell you what else we're doing as well. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Councilmember Powers, followed by him, Deutsch, I, and Brandon. I, I think we have uh, still, yeah. a, little bit out of that, a little bit of that still answer still, left. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry. So in addition to all of the enforcement work that you just heard about to identify and try and interdict where there are significant dealers involved and to try and find the product that's most problematic on the streets. We've also been working with all of the DAs on their diversion programs. Uh, the Staten Island Hope Program was out first. It's been out for about a year. They've had zero rearrests um, for the 318 people that have been through that program. There have some people who declined to go through it, but um, that's a pretty significant statistic. The Brooklyn Clear program launched about a month ago. They've already had um, 29 people enter the program and none rearrested. Bronx, we hope, will launch relatively soon. Manhattan hopes to launch in the summer. In addition to that, we have launched with HIDA and uh, the Department of Mental Health and Health and Mental Hygiene what we call RxStat Operations Group, which is a group co-convened by these three entities with over about 35 different agencies at the table. We meet quarterly. There are law enforcement, city, state, federal, regional law enforcement there. There are um, government agencies ranging from probation to the Department of Homeless Services. Everybody's there, h and &H is there, the ME is there. And those meetings have exposed opportunities for improved protocols, improved policy, where additional resources could be helpful. And many of the things that you'd hear about if you talk to any of these agencies originally came from conversations at those meetings where we review cases of fatal overdoses. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councilman Mr. Powers. Thank you. And I want to share everybody's uh, appreciation for being here and testifying and for the work that the department does every day. I know in all of our communities, we're grateful for having the, a world class uh, police force. And I share, but I do, you know, I do share the concerns that have been brought up by folks around pay compensation, attracting the best talent, retaining the best talent as well. I think we have great officers and, and, uh, and want to make sure we retain them. Um, I, I, I recall that. 
it was, this was about five or so years ago, Councilmember Brannon's predecessor had reached out to the Independent Budget Office related to shift times and whether there was cost savings that could be uh, achieved and potentially put into other places like salaries or, or, you know, or, or training or whatever, whatever it might be um, if you extended tours to longer shifts like 10 or 12 hours. Has the department looked at that and is that something that you're considering? And if, if so, where does that yeah, stand? No, we, and if we not, looked why? At, uh, our, our OMAP uh, Office of Management Planning uh, did a study on the 10 hour and 12 hour tours. And to do that, we would have to hire, uh, I don't want to give you, I don't know the exact number, but it was thousands of officers. So it's just, it's just something that, that couldn't be done. Vinny, I don't know if you, if you got anything you want to add to it? No, I would agree though. It was, it was thousands. It was not insignificant uh, in terms of the additional officers that would be needed because of the loss of patrol hours. You would need to have, what's the, how many officers are you, do you believe you need to hire in order to do that? I think the number was about 2,000, because what you're doing is you have less appearances per year. You'd need people to fill in that gap. And, and when did, was that report, that study done? It was in my time as chief of department, so I'd have to say two years. I'll have to, okay. I'll have to get it. That's we'll correct. get it to you. That's yeah. yeah, that'd be great if you have uh, any any research on that. And then my, my second question, sort of following up, is um, I noted that there was seemed like there was a record. We talked about the attrition, and we talked about the loss of officers. I know you're going to get us data on where folks are going, but I also noted that I know a number of people have been looking at uh, their pensions more recently. It looks, seems like a higher number than average. Is there? A, my concern would be with all the great programs you're putting in place right now that we're going to lose officers that have this training and have sort of integrated into the communities over the next few years as they as they sort of become disincentivized to stay into the force. Is, is there a concern about the loss of officers and what I would call brain drain in terms of the department if, if so many folks exit in the next coming years? I, I, it, and it's something I'm always concerned about and we have to make sure that we have uh, First of all, that the police officers are properly compensated, but we also have uh, a department where, where the men and women who do this job are motivated each and every day. And I think what we've done over the last uh, four years in particular, uh, the number of programs that we've created, the new positions that we created, the neighborhood coordination officers, steady sectors, strategic response group, uh, a number of federal task forces, the critical response command, uh, the uh, putting people, more people into the, into the cadet program to keep that uh, that, 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 that line of people entering the force uh, at, a, at a good pace and qualified people. So we are, this is something that I'm concerned with each and every day. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have uh, Chief Bob Boyce is, I think this is gonna be your last preliminary budget hearing. Bob is retiring on April 17th, I think. And you know, he's, he's, yeah, he's aging out. He doesn't look like it, but, but he actually is. <laughs> Um, yes, looks I'm like he's 35. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to be in a report that they. Uh, well, I, one more. <laughs> We're not question. losing you to another county, right? Just, no. just a follow <laughs> question, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, and, and congratulations, Bob, and uh, congratulations on a on a career and a soon retirement. And we don't want to lose Bob, by the way. We want to keep him. Um, my, I just well, just switching topics really quickly, and sorry to use more time than than allotted. Um, I, just a, the the part of, the part in your testimony about the turnstile jumping, and it seems like you have a noticeable opinion that's different than the district attorneys who are enforcing it and we live in this city with five different district attorneys who can who can take on different policies and then one police department so it's a it's a difference but can you tell me your your position on the the, the district attorney's turnstile jumping uh yeah, we, enforcement it seems like you have a difference of opinion yeah, we've had we've had a number of good meetings with uh da vance's vance and, and his office so uh, you're talking to a former transit cop. I came on the transit police department in 1983. It is very important that we control access to the subway. That's how we control crime in the subway. If you look now, we average about six crimes a day, uh, and that's about six million riders a day. So the way it, the way we operate now, uh, I think it's fair. Uh, most of the 20, 75 percent of the people who beat the fare uh, receive a tab summons, and the other 25 percent are arrested. And if you want. Uh, Chief Delatory can go into why we arrest that 25%, and most of it is because they're transit uh, recidivists. They continue to commit crimes in the subway system. I think it's important that we continue, we, we continually operate this way because the other millions of people who ride the subway every day see when people beat the fare, and it, it lends to a sense of disorder in the subway. And quite frankly, I don't think they're real appreciative of other people beating the fare while they, ha while they have to pay their fare each and every day. I think he's coming up to add something. 
Yes, hi, I'm Chief Ed Delatore, uh, Bureau Chief for the Transit Bureau. Um, just in line with the police commissioner was just saying, I think it's important to note that, uh, first of all, our fare evasion enforcement has gone down. We divert. We divert three out of four people that are arrested to the civil court. So we're already doing that. Out of those that we do not divert, that we arrest, about 10 to 20 percent of those do get desk appearance tickets. So there is a very small uh, percentage left that actually do go online and get arrested. We've also been meeting with the MTA and the district attorneys around the city to get feedback from them. Because obviously, if you're on the Pelham line, we don't want you to be treated in the Bronx differently from the way you'd be treated in Manhattan. So we've already had a meeting with Darcel Clark and the, the MTA chair, and we're going to continue to work our way around the city and meet with all the district attorneys. Th there will be only one policy in the NYPD for the entire city. Yep, I understand. And, and I, have to, I have to leave, and I apologize because I have to go actually speak to students in my district uh, about gun safety. And, and I would just note one comment before I leave is I, I would ask that is the, in terms of the department engaging, if it's, if it's the department that's engaging with the Department of Education around, around how to respond to the obviously important moments of the time that parents and students are involved in that conversation because I know there's a lot of trepidation about having the students, which we know the important safety measures we have to take, but having very young students have to go through what could be traumatic drills even that would lead to an expectation of violence or, or, or others. And I've heard from parents in that. So I'm not asking you not to take appropriate safety, safety measures quite, uh, quite, the, quite differently, but I do would ask that uh, to think about parent and student engagement in that, in that process because I think they're, they're the important stakeholders here that are, are effective in this. And whatever we do, we're not doing unilaterally. We're working with the DOE to make sure that we do it uh, uh, in conjunction with everybody involved there and we understand the sensitivity of it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, and I guess this is a plug to fun fear fears. Um, all right, we'll go to Councilmember Deutsch and then Brannon. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, so first of all, um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the first responders, including the NYPD, EMS, and uh, fire departments, and all the civilians who, uh, uh, who were out there yesterday in the helicopter crash. So our thoughts and prayers uh, are with the family. Um, and secondly, I'd like to congratulate uh, Chief Boyce uh, on your retirement. And it uh, doesn't mean that you could retire. You could always come back in plain clothes. So just want to say that for the record. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm not going to ask too many questions. I only have three minutes. Um, I just want to uh, speak about in response to Con uh, Councilmember Lance, uh, Lanceman's uh, um, questions. Um, how much does it cost to train a NYPD officer? Ben, you have that number? Chief Shortell, Chief of Training, $14,000. $14,000. So it's uh, $14,000 to train a, an officer. And then you have the training officers in, in the police academy and, and every, all the other costs that come with it to train an officer. So. Um, we had, uh, we have now uh, over a thousand people leaving the NYPD. So if you take those thousands of dollars to train an officer, uh, it's costing the city millions of dollars to train officers for other states. Because uh, the fact is that a state trooper makes uh, $40,000 more. Um, the cost of a house upstate New York and uh, in other states, and upstate New York, is probably approximately $200,000, and here in the city, if you want to buy a house, it's uh, around $800,000. So the cost of living here is a lot higher. Uh, we are, it's, it is costing the city millions, millions of dollars to train an officer for other states. So I just want to make that point for that. Um, secondly, um, I want to talk about the bulletproof vests. So first of all, I want to thank the commissioner for um, raising the allowance for our auxiliary officers from $250 to $425. That is, that is, uh, that is great. It's a, it's a home run for all our auxiliary officers who volunteer the time. We have uh, about 4,500 auxiliary officers who protect our streets in the city of New York. So um, our chair did mention that we're looking about uh, to, uh, uh, to outfit the school safety officers with Bill Provest. But I must say that currently uh, our 4,500 auxiliary officers do not have bulletproof vests that are up to date. 
uh, the expiration um, for a, the lifespan for a bull vest is five years. And I know that the police department has uh, purchased some uh, bulletproof vests for our police office, for auxiliary officers, but not enough because it's not in the budget. And we do have 4,500, and every time an auxiliary officer goes out uh, to protect our streets, he's unprotected. Thirdly, I just want to say, you'll answer the questions at the end. Thirdly, I want to say regarding um, Roto. So there are three different departments that tow cars. One is sanitation department, traffic department, as well as our local NYPD precincts. So if there is a vehicle that uh, plate, plate number does not, does not match the vehicle, or a car is parked for more than seven days in one spot, and it's marked by an NYPD officer, then that car um, gets towed to a pound. So the officer calls Roto, and a private company comes down, tows the vehicles, and it gets towed into a private lot. Um, I had about 15 cars just last week, actually three weeks ago in my district, that the plate numbers were way out of state. Um, the cars have been sitting there. They do move for alternate side of the street parking, only to come back, and those plates did not match the vehicle. The problem is, is that the lots that these vehicles get towed to have no room. So in the last three weeks, I only had one, one out of 15 vehicles towed um, in the last three weeks. So we have a beautiful NCO program where the officers go out there and try to do the job to tow these vehicles off the streets. But when a lot doesn't have any room, only for one vehicle, then we have a problem. So um, we need to figure out a way uh, to expand uh, and get more parking lots, so this way, uh, when 311 is called and uh, the NCO officers respond, that these vehicles get removed immediately, not, uh, shouldn't, not th that it shouldn't be towed because there's no room in the lots. Uh, Chief Terry Monahan, Chief Department. That, that shouldn't be an issue. These are all private companies that have their own lot, and this is how they make their money. We'll take a closer look at that and see. Because uh, there's numerous companies, if we need to add companies onto the rotation tow within that area, and they want to make that money, we, we can always do that. If, uh, if they're saying they can't take it, that, that's, uh, that's not acceptable. So, uh, okay, so if we could talk, we'll talk offline, offline about this, yeah. yeah. All right, we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal. We'll oh, so we have one more. I'm the uh, auxiliary vest. Wrap up. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. The aux auxiliary vest. So we um, we're taking we heard you on that. Ultimately, um, we're taking some <laughs> funds from our vest uh, budget, and we're beginning. Um, although, we're, as you actually accurately stated, we're continuing purchase of replacement vests for the auxiliaries. We will get to approximately half of them before the end of this fiscal year, and we're committing to do the remainder early next fiscal year. It's really about how many the manufacturer can produce for us under what schedule. But ultimately, by early next fiscal year, we will have replaced all of the auxiliary vests so that every auxiliary officer has access to a vest that is within that <coughs> five-year period. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Councilmember Brannon, followed by Hem Cabrera, then Williams. Thank you, Chair Richards. Um, Obviously, preface this by saying men and women of the police do an extraordinary job staring down the unknown every day, and that's uh, something we don't take for granted in the council. Um, I think I speak on behalf of, of all of us that um, we also don't see a contradiction in, in supporting the police, uh, but also wanting everyone to be held to the highest standard. Um, something that coming out of some of the questions today um, about brain drain and, and, and folks who are leaving before they take a pension and uh, the, you know, we had you know, 1,200 people at a pension seminar a couple of weeks ago out in Queens. Um, I know I saw the PBA did a survey back in 2016, uh, about six or 7,000 of its members talking about morale, um, and that morale was at rock bottom. Do we, I know it's sort of hard to quantify, but do, is there something going on there besides that they could make more money elsewhere that we think is, is affecting morale? I think uh, that's a general, uh, obviously a general statement. I know uh, I interact with police officers every day. I know all members of my executive team. Uh, I keep close contact with people in the field. So I'm not, I'm not going to agree with the premise uh, of the statement that morale is at an all-time low. Uh, as far as people attending pension 
uh, seminars, I encourage that because that doesn't, you should not be attending a pension seminar when you have 19 years on the, on the police department. You should be attending that seminar when you have five years on the job so you plan for the future. Just because you go to a pension seminar doesn't mean you want to leave. It means you want to uh, make sure that you're being uh, financially, uh, uh, that, 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 that you're paying attention as you move through your career. So, I mean, morale is always an issue. And that's why we have to make sure we keep people motivated. And for the 15th time today, I guess we're going to talk about compensation, properly compensated. But there's more to that also. Police officers have to feel that they're respected and, and that we appreciate that everything that they do each and every day. And I think that's why they are embracing the neighborhood policing philosophy. Now we're at a point where uh, police officers can go out. Uh, they use discretion. They identify problems with the community. They come up with solutions together. And now if you're working in a steady sector or an NCO, if I had a problem today, guess what? If I don't solve it, that problem's going to be there tomorrow. And that means that we, we are showing our cops that we care about them. So you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things going on here. I know that uh, uh, many of the different unions are in the process of collecting bargaining, collective bargaining too. So that might play into this. Yeah, I just hope you look to the council as partners. I mean, we want our police to be happy. I'm, I appreciate that I have the community policing program coming to all the precincts in my district and um, you know morale is, is, an, is an issue and we want to make sure we can be partners there and however we can be helpful. And I, and I, I agree with your statement that, uh, that we do work together but we do have to be accountable and we are held to a higher, higher standard and that's why we do what we do. Thank you Councilmember Brennan. We're going to move to Cabrera then Williams then Vallone. Thank you so much Mr. Chair, Commissioner, thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, I was looking at your testimony, and we're looking at the lowest crime uh, and shootings since actually before I was even born. Uh, best neighborhood uh, policing ever, fewest traffic uh, death, uh, the best counterterrorism unit. Uh, this, this is just simply amazing, the work uh, that you are doing alongside with the NYPD, and I just heard uh, my colleagues talk about morale. I mean, we should be praising the work that is taking place in the NYPD, and I, and I think that all of us in New York need to do a better job in, in creating a culture that embraces the NYPD a culture that says we value what you're doing. I remember 9-11, I was there uh, helping out as a chaplain, uh, and I saw the great work that the brave men, and how many uh, in the council and the city, everybody stood up, and then there was a shift that took place uh, some years after that. I, I think we need to come back and to uh, not only uh, morally support, but also in terms of legislation, and sometimes unintentionally, I think sometimes we could do things that uh, can demoralize uh, uh, the brave men. I mean, I wanted to ask you in regards to our earlier question uh, regarding uh, the opiate problem that we have in the city, having worked as the director of a rehab program before, I'm very familiar with this problem. Uh, you, you did a tremendous job, the NYPD did a tremendous job, department, in dealing with the K-2 problem. We, 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 it was just tremendous what I saw happen when we started seeing it blooming and we went to the source of it, which a lot of it was being sold in bodegas. It, it's the big problem that we have right now that this is being sold through doctors who are doing, uh, they're trying from what I understand, some of them are, are making $100,000 literally a week uh, towards the end of their career as a form of a retirement package. They do it for about a year, and they make a gazillion of money at the expense of our constituent. Is that where we're putting most of our efforts uh, to combat uh, this problem? Or is, I, I heard earlier that it was mentioned that the gangs, thank God, that the gangs are not the ones who, who are really moving uh, yeah. the opiates. Uh, yeah. So we'd love to know what the source and what's the strategy. And so we're not just looking at one area. We have to look at it uh, internationally. We do that with DETF. We have to look at it nationally, regionally. We also have to look at it at, uh, at the local level. And part of that is uh, you know, we're, we're looking at 
traditional dealers, we are looking at cartels, uh, we are looking at doctors also, so that's part of our strategy moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Williams, followed by him, Valone, then Menchaca. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner et al. Um, first, uh, obviously, I think we're in um, a, a much better place than we were before. I just want to make sure I want to put that on the record. And thanks to you. I served on panels with you before you were commissioner. I know you truly believe in the direction that we're uh, trying to do, and that is very helpful from the top. And I always want to make sure I put that on the record, sometimes to the chagrin of my advocacy friends, but uh, I try not to say things I don't believe, and I truly believe that. Uh, I also know that it, it, we got to where we got to with a lot of pushback. Every inch is a tremendous amount of pushback always. It seems to be the nature of the business. Um, I also know that we have a lot more work to do. I think everyone agrees with that. Uh, particularly around transparency and accountability. Um, but my hope is that as we continue to do that, I, it, it's, uh, I don't think we get gains without the pressure, so I'm just expecting that. But my hope is that we can have those conversations without people uh, asserting or uh, pushing forth that we are somehow opposed to police, uh, because during those discussions, that's not what this is about, and I don't want it to affect the morale, and I think how we talk about it is particularly important. Um, I have a few things I won't be able to get through all in three minutes, so I'll lay them out, and hopefully you can respond. Um, I was very, very uh, encouraged by the description of neighborhood policing, looking like it's moving toward a real community uh, policing program. Specifically, we're saying it's not a program, it's not an initiative, um, it is a philosophy. I'd be interested to hear not now, but at some point, it's top to bottom approach, exactly how that is uh, pervasive throughout the uh, entire uh, force, because I do like the program, but I do want it to get uh, a philosophy that everyone uh, is adopting. Uh, when it comes to the subway phase, fares, I did uh, read your description of someone who was caught obviously um, doing that. I don't. Uh, I guess violating the, the fare program or the subway fares. I don't think people should uh, be run ropshod uh, over the subway system, but I think everything has to be applied um, equally. I don't think that has happened, um, particularly in uh, different communities. I also I look at people who don't, uh, for many years, be able to go through the toll system. I don't know anybody who has been arrested, um, and so there seems to be a dichotomy there. I also think there's some legality between asking for a swipe and giving a swipe that might be legal somewhere in there. I don't see the same thing when it comes to easy pass. And so I think how we treat communities should also be equal. With the marijuana West, of course, that's already been brought up. I just want to lend my uh, name to that. Perhaps there are other things that we can do with the marijuana arrests that are not just police involved, and I know you believe in making sure that police aren't the answer uh, to everything. I would like to know when we're gonna promulgate rules for video releasing. Uh, I think that's something that we just have a lot more work to do. Um, with the CR team, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the, the response team, the CRT, crisis response team, um, is there a way and is there a cost to separate those that are responding uh, to counterterrorism uh, versus those that are responding to uh, peaceful protests? Uh, lastly, of the BuzzFeed article, uh, it is very, very concerning to me. Uh, I know you did respond it. Uh, with claim, the claims with their penalties are often coupled with dismissal probations, but we do know that Officer John McLaughlin, uh, who broke protocol during uh, the Ramali Graham case, kicked in the door, led to his death. I lied on the stand during the NYPD trial. He was given dismissal probation at the end of 2017. To the knowledge of the Romali's family, um, what was communicated by the NYPD, there was no other discipline. So I'm asking if we can get uh, disaggregated um, by the type of offense, specifically the number of dismissal pro probations related to pro police brutality incidences each year, and what other discipline uh, was leveled. And I know that was a lot of questions. You can respond to what you can. I would say I also believe uh, also, my advocacy friends are probably going to shrink, but I do believe our officers need to be paid. I am in the business of making sure that employees all over get a, a fair wage so they can live <coughs> in this city. So I do support that. Uh, hopefully we can. If you give someone a gun and ability to take life or take away freedom, I want to make sure they're co properly compensated. I would be even more supportive if we looked at the qualifications of officers needing uh, to come into uh, the department. Thank you. All right, so just real quick, uh, neighborhood policing philosophy, uh, Rodney, Chief Harrison, and, and Chief Monahan would be more than happy to sit down with and you and uh, other members of the council to let you know how we are pushing that into not just patrol, but to all aspects of, of the police department. Body-worn cameras, uh, we should have a, uh, a finalized policy on release of uh, camera footage that should be done shortly. 
I think uh, uh, Commissioner Byrne said between 30 and 45 days. SRG, I think, is what you were speaking about, the Strategic Response Group. Their mission is threefold. Uh, if there is a spike in crime somewhere in the city, uh, we can deploy them. They also have the ability to respond to a terrorist event or active shooter, and they also have received uh, a very extensive training in, uh, in, uh, in, in policing protests and demonstrations. So their mission is threefold. That they came out of the patrol borough task forces. We saw that uh, each patrol borough had their own task force, and uh, we, uh, this came back in uh, re-engineering back in 2014. And we decided it was better to have a group of 800 cops that had that threefold mission. And uh, I think, last but not least, I do agree with you, and I've stated on the record numerous times, uh, we need to be better with uh, police discipline transparency, and we're working towards that end. Uh, thank you. Um, if the, I don't know if we can follow up on the data that I uh, tried to get for um, the response to the BuzzFeed. Also, I didn't get to ask about, uh, there's supposed to be a task force in terms of EDP. That was actually administration. I would love to get a response to that. Ed, uh, Susan, you want to talk about the mental health task force? And before she does that as well, you know, in just in terms of the BuzzFeed, because we don't want to get too deep into it today, but transparency is important. And, and one of the things we also want to hear is a little bit more about 50A and where we're at with the state and the push there. But it really does, you know, articles like this undermine the work of every good officer out there who's doing great work day in and day out. And I'm hoping, you know, transparency is one way that we can truly build a, a great community rapport with police. And without that, it undermines the good work that officers do day in and day out. And, and, and we, you've, have you never heard me say yeah. anything to the contrary? Yeah. Agree with that? And we're looking to build trust throughout the city, and it mm. works both ways. Yeah. I think we do, uh, uh, we do, the NYPD does things many uh, very well, but there are some things we don't do well. And uh, p police disciplinary system is, is mm. not something that we're doing well. And I've gone on the record, and mm -hmm. we're working with the administration to make sure that uh, uh, 50A is, is changed so we can, uh, we can do that. And let me go on the record and just say I think there are obviously way more police officers doing the right thing than the wrong thing, just as there are way more politicians doing <laughs> the right thing than the wrong things. Um, but transparency is one way we can really cut through it, and, and that's the only way we'll truly uh, meet our goals. You can continue, I'm sorry. Just to respond to your question, Councilmember Williams, uh, the police department has gone on record supporting uh, either the reconstituting of the old behavioral health task force or a new working group, but we have been continuing to work even as that hasn't yet happened. Uh, we did a, a pretty substantial review within the police department of our response to people who are mentally ill quite recently and are in the process of implementing several recommendations. So any the work has that, continued. Any idea when it will be either reconstituted or new, or move forward? It's really a city hall conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. We've been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez, and now we'll hear from Ballone, then Menchaca, then Miller. Thank you, Chair, and officially good afternoon. Commissioner, thank you, and God bless you and the NYPD for all that you do for the greatest police force in the world, not just here. Um, I've had some revelations lately in, in district, and I think we are on the tip of the iceberg with school safety. Um, I, I think we need, as a city, to redirect our priorities, first and foremost, to the children of the city. Um, other than hearing then, want agreeing with Chair's uh, bill to put vests on our school safety agents, I'd like to hear from you as to how we can maybe create a school safety task force or talk about increasing police presence in our schools since we don't have enough officers to do that. So I had put in a package of 10 bills about a month ago directly on police safety and public safety in the schools. I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on maybe how we can start to allay some of the concerns of the people in the city and our principals and teachers about safety in our schools. Yes, uh so we have 5,300 school safety agents. We have, uh, we should have at this time 120 people in the school safety task force. They're NYPD officers. So with the school safety task force, with uh, the precinct personnel, uh, specifically the NCOs who have a very good relationship with, with all the schools and their sectors, we are absolutely looking to increase our presence at, at, uh, at schools, especially in the morning and in the afternoon. 
So we're in the process of figuring out exactly how to do that. Um, we have right now uh, that school safety task force, we have the, the steady sectors, we have the NCOs, uh, and we are just making, we're doing our best to make sure we're at uh, as many schools as we can be every day, and we're looking to solidify that. Are we at full capacity for the school safety agents? 5,300. So at my neck of the woods in Northeast Queens, we recently had an incident um, in one of the Whitestone schools where uh, we were advised there are not enough agents to cover each and every school in the city, and that often what happens is agents are pulled from other schools to cover existing schools, and we want to make sure that we have enough agents for every one of our schools. Hello, oh, yes, good afternoon. Nilda Hoffman, Chief of Community Affairs. I oversee the School Safety Division, and um, our current headcount that we authorize right now is 5,063, and we have 5,189. So we are a, a little over, but we're putting in um, certain in March now, we're putting in um, over 250 because of attrition. We know that we lose every month, and then we have another class going in in June. So with those classes, will we have at least one officer in every school in the city? Well, these are school safety agents that I'm speaking about. Correct. The officers, um, like the police commissioner mentioned, we're working out my, my officers that I currently have. We have uniform task force, which we should be up at 125 police officers. And in addition with um, Chief Rodney Harrison's patrol, the NCO and the steady sectors, um, we will be covering um, many of the schools within the city. Hey, Commissioner, I just want to end by saying when you're to trans no, there's a school transitioning school. over to the NCO program, some of the precincts had school safety officers, which are now becoming the NCO officers. There's concern with the principals and the teachers in losing the school safety officer to the NCO program. So we need to make sure there's coordination specifically with that precinct and the NCO team to make sure that the schools like Francis Lewis and Bayside High School, two of the largest high schools in the city, who are losing their school safety officers to the NCO program, make sure that those officers are fully aware as to what there is, because I'm getting concerns from that. From those, those schools uh, and precinct COs have discretion whether or not they want to assign someone to a specific school or not. So in addition to the NCO, this is something that will be up to the discretion of each CO. But every school it is covered by a school safety agent, and and specific school you're talking about has one in seven, um, has a supervisor in seven school safety agents. Thank, Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I think Thank I you. Forward to the public safety. Thank you. Council Members Menchaca, Council Member Menchaca, followed by Menchaca, Miller, then Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, and the panel for coming out and talking to us. Uh, I, I also want to make sure that I, I say that it's, it's important as we talk and dig deep to understanding the investments that are being made by the NYPD that we highlight all the incredible work that's happening in our communities. The 7-2 is being led by, I think, an incredible rising star, uh, Deputy Inspector Gonzalez, uh, and a lot of the work that he's doing with the NCO team and our community engagement uh, has changed. And that's the kind of investment that I also want to talk about, the kind of human capital within the NYPD and making sure that we have diverse uh, leadership growing at all times. And so as we talk about d numbers and cents, let's, let's also make sure that we, we think about how, how this works in human capital. Um, specifically though, I want to talk a little bit about um, a, a, a part of this connection with NYPD is the foundation, the NYPD foundation. Can you talk, us, talk to us a little bit about how the, the NYPD foundation works in supplementing the work that you do uh, every day? The Police Foundation? The Police Foundation. Yeah, this came out of uh, the post-NAP commission. We wanted to make sure that any uh, contributions that are made to the police department are funneled through one, one entity, and that's the Police Foundation. And over the years, they've been able to uh, help us tremendously uh, keep the city, they do a great job in helping keeping the city safe. A couple of different things that they've helped fund, they've helped fund the pilot project for body one cameras, they've helped uh, in funding initially with uh, bullet resistant vests, uh, they're helping us with the public engagement campaign. They help us with the community, with the foreign liaison program, another way we keep the city safe. So each and every day, the foundation uh, it really greatly contributes uh, to the safety of the people of this city, and I'm very thankful to them. In, in some ways, I've kind of heard as well that there's been positive impact on the ground yep. for this kind of auxiliary support that comes in from private citizens. Is there a way that we, is, is there, or I guess in what ways are these funds made public? to say us and 
and the community about about spending. Can you talk, talk to us a little bit about how that gets out? Yeah, Larry Byrne, our uh, Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, will talk about Great. that. Larry Byrne for legal. <coughs> With the Police Foundation, which is a private, separate <coughs> legal organization with their own legal obligations, and with that matter for any other organization that donates goods, services, or funds to the department, uh, we report that several times a year to the Conflict of Interest Board. Uh, so every nickel that the Police Foundation has given us has been disclosed. Um, with something like the Foreign Liaison Program, we don't go into great detail about that, but the money, the fact that they fund that program and the money they give us is, uh, is publicly disclosed in addition to our filings with the Conflict of Interest Board. How detailed is that report? I, I haven't seen I'm it, happy so I'll to look send at you it. the report. I can after that we'll put it on the to-do list after the hearing. It's I believe we file it twice a year. Okay, and I know we only have three minutes, but uh, th this is just another area where we can have a fuller picture about what the city is offering in, ter in terms of or in term of city tax levy dollars and then private citizens, uh, and and where where this is going to fill gaps. Uh, yeah, or, the for police, the department. Right, as the police commissioner said, uh, the police foundation was actually formed in the 1970s, mm -hmm. not only after the NAF commission, but when the city was going through a fiscal crisis where there was not only a hiring freeze, uh, but more than 5,000 police officers, many with more than five years experience, were laid off. And uh, the people who formed the police foundation at that time were concerned about public safety the very first program they funded was they bought the first bulletproof vest for officers. And as the crime and now terrorist threat have expanded, uh, they've continued to refocus uh, what programs they fund at the request of the commissioner and the department. All good news to share. Thank you. I think he's getting at the commercials. They're a little cheesy. At least from people I've heard. In the See, now I've heard the exact opposite. I've heard the exact opposite. Wow. Um, oh, and I have to also <laughs> that's comment. That's on record. Thank you, Donovan. <laughs> and on a super side note, I just I love your tie. I have, I've, been, I've been admiring it from here, and I just want to say, rock on. Everyone up there right now, all right, bringing out the not color. not be a love fest, all right? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Let's go Bye. to Councilman Bob Miller, then Rosenthal, then Rodriguez, and, uh, and I believe we're fun. Finish. Thank, Thank you, you for being Richards. kind to us. Yeah. Oh, you have another stop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Commissioner, good to have you and your team here again. Uh, talk about the work that we're doing. Obviously, being the safest big city in America has value, and your department uh, creates value for, um, for our city, uh, attracting tourist business and the other things. So I'm, with that being said, I'm going to put my labor hat on and talk about the, the CBA uh, ongoing CBA talks that you won't talk about, but uh, being that this is a budget hearing, I would like to know what number has been set aside uh, to address yeah. the, 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 the any. We, uh, it's, I don't have a number ultimately that because this is handled in CBA, we from a budgetary perspective aren't involved in those discussions. So I've been involved in many agencies, CBAs, as a former union president, in order for us to, to, to know what that happens, we have to know that the budget is, is able to support that. You, you don't have any number that goes, not even the number that is associated with the uh, pattern bargaining. It's the city's budget, though. Our budget obviously currently doesn't have funding for that, so that's why, I, like my office, the, the NYPD's budget is not consulted Okay, so that's when, when we meet with uh, Office of Collective Bargaining, then we'll have that conversation there. Um, but I do, again, want to try to emphasize that I, I think that fair compensation for uh, a department that brings such value to the city is, is only fair. And I think it sets the tone for all the workers here in the city of New York. Um, so with that, I'm going to... I want to I want to address some quick policy stuff because I do have I want to touch digress and talk talk about the marijuana piece real quick. Um, we've I think the last last year's budget we discussed uh, uh, um, the influx of 18 wheelers throughout the city and the problems that we were having in different boroughs, particularly in Southeast Queens, and we were talking about tow trucks, uh, pounds boots 
and uh, has there been any headway made on that from the last budget? And or if not, is there funds to support that in this budget? Uh, Chief Chan and uh, Commissioner Grippo can speak to that. Tom. Thomas Chan, Chief of Transportation. <clears throat> uh, we've took, taken a look certainly at our Queens Command for Traffic Enforcement um, uh, District. And uh, we, at that particular location, uh, we have 20 tow trucks that are assigned, dedicated to them. We also have one heavy duty tow. We also use booting as part of our process to, uh, to prohibit uh, illegal parking and things of that nature. And they have 18, and we added four additional boots to that particular unit, so they have 22 boots. Heavy duty boot boots, which we use on tractor trailers and other large vehicles and things of that nature, they also have six of them assigned. Um, again, we've been doing enforcement in terms of uh, towing throughout uh, Queens itself. Um, there are some specific commands um, you might be interested in, but uh, for overall for Queens, in 2017, we towed approximately 18,045 vehicles. In, uh, tow in terms of booting vehicles, we, in 2017, we booted 7,000 and 65 vehicles also in, in so we, we are more we, we are interested specifically in the in the heavy equipment commercial vehicles the uh, 18 wheels and so forth there are residential communities that are inundated with that we've been attempting to address this for a while so if we can talk about that offline and, and I would really appreciate that absolutely I do want to expect that but while we do have you up here and talking about transportation um, is there any intention to expedite the van enforcement unit commuter van enforcement unit do we we've been working uh, diligently on the uh, dollar van services and I would venture to say that a majority of, of our enforcement has occurred in the Queen South area um, just to give you a little uh, perspective in terms of 2017 uh, we've issued over 1,600 summonses uh, towards okay. dollar van services, um, and in 2018, uh, we've issued 1,091 summonses. And we've continued to work with the uh, uh, Patrol Borough Queen South in terms of targeting uh, enforcement. We know that uh, it's problematic. Uh, there is a um, there is compensation in terms of being out there, and certainly if they're illegal, they're not properly licensed. But our officers from our citywide traffic task force have been working very closely with um, Patrol Borough Queen South in terms of dealing with this particular situation, and we anticipate that we will continue to work on that. Thank you, and, and, they, and they have been working on it. Um, so on the, I, I don't want to, to, to continue to, to debate the merits of the marijuana issue here. Uh, my frustration is that we've been having this conversation for a number of years here now, and particularly as it, it relates to the 105th precinct. 105th precinct, time and time again, leads the city disproportionately in marijuana uh, summonses and arrests. Um, if indeed there is a unit that is charged with aggregating this data, how is it that time and time again, the same precinct has disproportionate numbers and those communities haven't received any relief from this problem, that we're not having this conversation unless we're having this conversation here now. The fact of the matter is, last year we attempted to have this same conversation when numbers came out, but they've led the city seven, eight years in a row. Yeah. At what point is enough enough and that we really sit down and deal with the numbers that you are being charged with aggregating. And, and when you see those numbers, you see that it's a problem. What are we doing about it? So this is the conversation I think uh, you were at the community meeting I was at, the same one out in, uh, in the 105 last year. And uh, we are looking at uh, the 105. They are becoming a neighborhood policing command in April. And you know, you said what you said at that meeting, and then right after you left the meeting, and as I was attempting to leave, I had about 15 homeowners come up to me and say, you know, what, what uh, Councilman Miller said is all well and good, but uh, you know, we're a part of this community too, and we want you to continue enforcement. So we do have to strike a balance. I uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah. agree, but you know, um, myself, the council member, my colleagues, uh, we attend every community board, civic, church, synagogue, mosque, uh, community meeting there, and the general consensus is not consistent with that statement that you just made. Right, and I, intend, I that. intend 
community yeah. meetings all over the city. Yeah. And, and that's certainly not, not when you have disproportionately over 2,000 and second is 400. That's a ridiculous number. And when we attempted to address this last year, we started out at 1,800 and we have now 400 more than we had last year. That is not resolving an issue. Um, that is, this is not just something that occurred last year. This is a phenomenon that has existed in that particular precinct for nearly a decade now, throughout large, far greater than the rest of the city. Now, is there, furthermore, is there a, a, a correlation that you see with the disproportionate summons and arrests of that what appears to be target audience and the lack of recruitment from that same demographic? And, and that's something that we have to look at. You know, we have to make sure that we're recruiting from all parts of the city. And, and uh, that's, some, that's part of, of what we're look at, looking at going forward. And I know we've had this discussion. Uh, we do have to respond to community complaints. And we will work with the council to make sure that we come up with an equitable solution here. Um, and f finally, uh, what is the policy on, um, on metal detectors? How do you determine what schools receive metal detectors? And, and All right, Chief, Chief Conroy can speak about that. Brian. Uh, we base the, uh, the deployment of metal detectors on a lot of factors, but certainly uh, crime in a school, the number of weapons covered in the past at that school, threats to that school. So we do an, uh, an ongoing assessment of where our, our scanning is deployed. And we have the ability to also deploy for a day scanning in any school, middle school or high school throughout the city. I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank you. And, and Commissioner, it's always a pleasure to see you and your team. And I'm hoping, as the chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, that we'll have our biannual meeting so we can schedule that sometimes in the near future to further discuss some of the policies that we're talking about. Look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last two questions. I know the Commissioner has to go. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Rosenthal Rodriguez. And then we'll close out this session. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to quickly say I've always appreciated, as you know, uh, how quickly you've defended the rights of survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And I just wanted to reiterate that today. It is noteworthy. Thank you. Um, I was wondering along those lines, uh, money was put in the budget last year for um, trauma sensitivity training. Um, I know when we spoke again last year, the uh, Special Victims Division had been trained, but most of the frontline cops had not been trained. And I was just wondering how that was coming along. All right. Yeah. Susan? So there's different kind of training at different levels. The FETI training that I think you're referring to, the new forensic experiential trauma interview training. We've trained 170 people in SVD in that, and we'll continue to train more people. We are also currently reviewing the sexual assault curriculum at the academy, which hasn't been updated in a number of years to make sure that there are, there's a trauma-informed uh, portion of it. And what's the timing on that? On the academy curriculum? Will the curriculum be updated by the time of your next academy training or the next time you have an opportunity? Probably, probably not by the next class. We are, we're working internally, and then we will work with a number of advocates to review it as well. So it'll take a few months. Is there anything I can do to help facilitate that? It's pretty important. I think, I think it's a pretty good schedule. I mean, I think in, a, in three months or so, you'll have a new curriculum. Right, but we, we won't we just, have trained the cops that are right in front of our Yeah, we just, we just met with a number of advo advocacy groups uh, about a week and a half ago, and they asked that they help create right. that curriculum. So that's going to you know, uh, add a little bit of time, but I think it will make the training that much better. Right. My guess yeah. is they'd be available today yeah. Yeah. to meet with you to work on that. We are working as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, and secondly, as it has to do with school crossing guards, um, last year in the terms and conditions, we asked for a report on every council district or every precinct, 
And um, unfortunately, my precinct was left out of that report. This year, it's in there. And according to the report, uh, it's something like three out of 20 positions are filled currently. This is at the 2-0. Um, that could be old information. But uh, you know, last year, we made it very clear to everyone that with two or three new schools coming online at a particular corner, we were going to need more um, crossing guards. And uh, someone applied for the job back in September, a parent, a local parent. And uh, she didn't, <laughs> the timing was such that I don't think she's going to come on the job until like a month from now, or it might be this month, maybe in March. But meanwhile, there's been no crossing guard at 60th and West End Avenue where we just opened a new public school, a private school opened, and we have three other schools up the block on West 60th, so, or 61st. Um, take, Chief Harrison will take a look at the two. Thank you. Okay. It's been very distressing for the okay. parents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you. Commissioner, first of all, thank you for the great job that you do leading an agency that keep our city safe, uh, even though we don't agree on everything. But as I said before, as a father of two daughters, we rely on the men and women, the YPD, to be sure that the street is safe for everyone. It, I had a question on the collision investigation squad, and that one is very specific because of my time. How many men and women do we have in that investigation we, squad? We went, right from, now? Uh, we went from 22 to 25. How many? 22 to 25. I think that we should double the number. Uh, in 2016, we have 40,000, a uh, average of 40,000 hit and run. Uh, is that number the same? What that number was for 2016? Was that number the same in 2017? It's, it's close. Um, in 2017, 40,868 uh, situations were it's property damage. Um, 5,138 cases where we actually had some type of injury, and a, a total number of 46,006. Um, in terms of comparison to last year in 2016, we had a slight decrease. Um, increase or decrease? Decrease. In decrease. No, I'm sorry. Increase. Increase. Of 226, half a percent. Yeah. From so I, I hope that City Hall, and, and this is advocating for all of us, we really work to double the number. Uh, that's, you know, it's an epidemic. You know, sometimes we hold press conference. Uh, Chief Chang doing a great job, those men and women in the squad doing a great job, but they're not enough to, res to be deep, go deep in the investigation. You know, unfortunately, there's those drivers that they flee in the scene. Sometimes we have the resources to arrest it, but I feel that we should invest more resources. So my call is for in City Hall to double the number of the men and women designated to the investigation squad unit. The second concern that I have is, I don't feel that we have a Latino voice in the city advocating for our, our representation. We are the second largest group. We are 29% of the New York City population. And I give you credit for understanding that we had to create a pipeline. And to create a pipeline does, would not happen overnight. And we saw we Assistant Chief Pichardo and, and other that you were able to promote it. But when you look at the charge and you see individual in charge per borough for the investigation unit, anti-terrorists and all those special units, I would like to see more diversity. And of course, I will be advocating for everyone, for the, all of us together, but specifically when they look at the faces here or the Latino being 29%, what can we expect for the pipeline to be moving faster so that we can leave the best legacy under your leadership? Well, we just had uh, the results, the initial results from the sergeant's test and the demographics of the people that passed that test uh, closely matched the demographics of the department, which closely, I think closer and closer to matching the demographics of the city. Each and every position that comes available, I am very mindful of uh, diversity and, and making sure we have the right person in that job. 
And this is something I spend a tremendous amount of time of, and we've had on, and we've had this conversation numerous times. And as you see, as the diversity of the department, especially in the upper ranks, is getting better and better each and every day. Thank you, Commissioner. So we're going to begin to close out. Just a few more points, and then uh, we will close out. So I wanted to know, and I don't know if you can give us uh, the uh, status of uh, the investigations around uh, Detective Rice in, in terms of falsifying reports, allegedly falsifying reports, and what safeguards are being put in place there, uh, and then also the status of uh, where the investigation is around uh, the protests uh, with the strategic response uh, group and uh, in the offices that I know there was one officer put on desk duty or something of that nature. Uh, have there been any findings? When can we expect I can't, those? I can't, can't give you any particulars about uh, the, uh, Detective Rice. I know that's an ongoing investigation. Okay. And then uh, with uh, SRG, I, we did end up uh, transferring one individual out of that unit, and the investigation is, is not complete into that incident yet. Okay, and you don't have a time frame I on don't, that. I don't. All right, and then I couldn't let you get out of here without talking about overtime, and then we'll close out. Um, so... In the overtime, since that we were supposed to leave at 12? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep oh, you on oh, the clock a little I bit I mean, general longer. overtime. Um, <laughs> Um, so can you speak to uh, how we're going to sure. do better? Well, ultimately, um, last year, the department, in terms of uni uniformed overtime, came in $5 million under budget. That budget, of course, included um, significant adjustment for overtime related to the election, uh, the Trump election, and then ultimately um, the compensation we got from the federal government to offset that. And so you've been completely reimbursed on that? We, we have, we, we will get complete full reimbursement of around approximately 60 million. We've received about 30 million of it. But ultimately, in accounting for the reimbursement needed for last fiscal year, we came in about 5 million under that uniform overtime budget. We're tracking now, of course, uh, this year there, is, there was actually some additional uh, both Trump overtime spending that's going to be reimbursed by the feds. We, and what's with the total on that? That for this fiscal year is approximately 10 or $12 million, I believe. Right. And we don't expect any um, penalties for being a sanctuary city as well, so you still expect correct, uh, correct. other like safe security grants, correct. I believe, and other things correct. that come through. Okay. And, and with that projection of both the overtime and the reimbursement, we right now looking at the budget through January, which is where we have good data, um, we anticipate a similar surplus of about five to eight million dollars in for the over uniformed overtime budget. Okay. Alrighty. Well, I want to thank you, Commissioner, for extending your overtime here uh, today, and uh, I want to thank the department for the work that you you do. And and I, by no means do we want you to think that we're trying to undermine. And we value everything you do. Uh, we do still truly believe that accountability and transparency and a better quality of life. Uh, for our offices is as critical in driving down crime in this city. I know you believe in that as well. So we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, to strengthen our relationship. So thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I treated you nice at my first one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We're going to begin again in five minutes with CCRB.
All right, CCRB here. All righty. All right, we're going to start this up again. All righty. Oh. All righty. Good afternoon and welcome again to the Committee on Public Safety's Fiscal Year 2019 Preliminary Budget Hearing. We just heard from the Police Department and now we will hear for testimony. We will hear testimony from the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Before we proceed, I would like to recognize the members, if there are any left, <laughs> of the committee who have just joined us, Councilmember Rodriguez, and I'm sure uh, other people will be popping in and out. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for CCRB remains nearly unchanged since the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. Today, I hope to learn more about the priorities that are not reflected in the administration's plan and an update on initiatives implemented in the previous fiscal year. Uh, we will ask you to swear them in, and then we may begin. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Are you going to read all six pages? <laughs> yes. Pressure my uh, press the light up red. There you All go. Right. All right, Chairperson Richards, uh, members of the Public Safety Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It has been my privilege to serve as acting chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board for the last three years. I'm joined uh, by my colleagues at the agency, Jonathan Darch, our executive director and Jerrica Richardson, our senior uh, advisor and secretary to the board, as well as Janine Marie, who is our deputy executive director for administration. The city charter charges the CCRB with the fair and independent investigation of civilian complaints against sworn members of the New York City Police Department. Our jurisdiction includes uh, allegations involving the use of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and the use of offensive and the use of offensive language referred to as FATO. We take that role seriously, evaluating each case individually. The board makes findings, and where the evidence supports disciplinary action, the board recommends discipline to the police commissioner. The CCRB is the largest police oversight entity in the country, overseeing the investigation, mediation, and administrative prosecution of misconduct in the largest police department in the nation. Throughout 2017, the CCRB worked to build a cohesive, effective, and efficient agency by filling, filling key staff positions and proactively reviewing internal policies and strategic development. The agency, under the management of Executive Director Jonathan Darsh, who was appointed in May of 2017, has new leadership in several units, including communications, outreach, and intergovernmental affairs, operations, policy and advocacy, and the Administrative Prosecution Unit, known as APU. Following recent developments in New York City policing, including the expansion of body-worn cameras, which we'll refer to as BWC, um, the body-worn camera program, and the passage of the Right to Know Act, the CCRB has increased investigative training and video analysis, created new ways of tracking receipt of footage from the department, and develop new categories of allegations related to violations of the Right to Know Act. Further, after a long period of review and development, we recently began to investigate and administratively prosecute allegations of sexual misconduct by police officers. The agency also recommitted itself to better serving vulnerable and diverse communities in New York. In 2017, the outreach unit expanded to include intergovernmental affairs and delivered 828 presentations to audiences, including uh, constituent services staff for various offices, high school students, immigrant populations, probationary groups, homeless service organizations, formerly incarcerated individuals, NYCHA residents, and LGBTQ groups. The CCRB remains dedicated to conducting hundreds of interactive and informative workshops throughout the five boroughs while building strategic partnerships with city agencies, educators, and service providers to better serve New York City's various populations. All agency board meetings are open to the public and half of those are conducted in the city's various communities where residents can attend and meet with our staff and express to the board their issues and concerns in a local setting. 
the CCRB's Policy and Advocacy Unit began systemic reviews of issues, complaints, and NYPD's, NYPD policies impacting homeless individuals and youth, and plans to issue a number of reports in 2018, including a follow-up uh, to our 2016 TASER report. Investigations. In 2017, the CCRB received 4,487 complaints within its jurisdiction, an increase of 5.3%. 2017 was the first time complaints increased since, 20, since 2009. One of the challenges to successfully determine what happened uh, in any incident under investigation is the spoilation of evidence, whether it is um, video from commercial or privately owned surveillance cameras, cell phones taken by private citizens, or, in, or NYPD surveillance cameras. The Phil Evidence Collection Team proactively gathers evidence of these types, and the CCRB requests footage from the NYPD's body-worn cameras as well. The importance of video evidence to CCRB investigations cannot be overstated. In 2017, the board substantiated 31 percent of full investigations where there was evidence, where there was video evidence, as compared to 14 percent where there was no video evidence. Video evidence did not only influence substantiation rates. In 2017, 55% of allegations with evidence were closed on the merits, that is, substantiated, exonerated, or found, uh, found un to be unfounded, compared to 38% without video. The availability of video evidence allows for clear interpretation of circumstances and thus an increase in the rate of substantiated, unfounded, and exonerated allegations. By early 20, February 2018, the NYPD had rolled out body-worn cameras to at least one tour of duty at 24 different precincts citywide. In 2017, the CCRB requested uh, body-worn camera footage and 165 complaints, a number that will only grow as the NYPD's program expands in 2018 to include all members of service on patrol assignments. As you heard, video evidence is extremely beneficial to the CCRB's investigations. The quality of the cameras combined with audio recording makes BWC footage more useful than any other types of recordings. The NYPD accelerates the, uh, the BWC program, means that the CCRB will need to address current limitations on the storage of video evidence. At current rates, the agency will run out of video evidence space in less than three years. As it is expected that the department will issue all patrol officers a BWC earlier than anticipated, this timeline is likely to be even shorter for the agency running out of uh, storage space for footage. The agency is working with OMB and DOIT to make sure that we are able to meet the demands of the BWC program. When the Council passed the Right to Know Act, the agency began preparing for its implementation. Starting in October 2018, officers for the first time will be required to hand out business cards doing all level two and level three stops. The card will include the number for 311 and an indication that citizens may call the number if they wish to commit, if they wish to comment on their interactions with officers. Those calls will be routed to the CCRB and the agency will be prepared to effectively manage the anticipated increase in complaints. In addition, officers equipped with body-worn cameras will be required to record themselves giving guidance and requesting permission before searching individuals. Officers who are not yet equipped with BWCs will have to find an alternative objective procedure to document the request. Failures to give guidance, request informed consent, or properly record the interaction will be additional allegations the agency will be investigating. Discipline. In those cases where the board substantiates allegations and recommends that an officer receive the most serious type of discipline, that is charges and specifications, the Administrative Prosecution Unit prosecutes these, prosecutes these cases in the NYB, NYPD trial room. As far as we've been able to ascertain, the CCRB is the only civilian oversight agency in the country that prosecutes cases in the trial section of the law enforcement agency that they oversee. Compromised of attorneys and trial assistants, the APU prosecutes misconduct before the NYPD Deputy Commissioner for Trials, 
In 2017, the APU conducted 37 trials and closed a total of 112 cases. Of the cases closed by the APU in 2017, 53% resulted in some form of disciplinary action and 44% resulted in a suspension or loss of vacation time between one and 20 vacation days. When the board recommends instructions, formalized training, or command discipline against a member of service, that recommendation is sent to the Department Advocate's Office. In 2017, the board recommended command discipline, a recommendation for a loss of vacation days and the second most serious disciplinary recommendation following charges and specifications. The board recommended, uh, the board recommended command discipline for 51% of the 367 officers against whom there was a substantiated allegation, up uh, from 43% in 2016. The NYPD imposed discipline on officers in 73% of the cases where the board recommended discipline other than charges and specification. And 42% of the time, the discipline imposed by the NYPD con concurred with that recommended by the board. Mediation. In addition to investigating cases, the agency has a robust mediation program, successfully mediating 204 cases in 2017. The mediation program is an important tool for the CCRB to improve police community relations. Cases are not only sent to the me mediation program at the civilian's request. Cases are only sent to the mediation program at the civilian's request. Mediation sessions focus on fostering discussion and mutual understanding between civilians and subject officers. After a successful mediation, the complaint is closed as mediated, meaning there will, no, there will be no further investigation and the officer will not be disciplined. If the mediation is not successful, the case returns to the investigations division for a full investigation. Successful mediations benefit communities because of a measure of trust and respect uh, often develops between the parties. That in turn can lead to better police community relations. In 2017, the mediation success rate increased from 88% to 90%. The mediation unit is implementing changes in how it prepares both civilians and members of the NYPD for mediation sessions in an effort to continue to improve the mediation success rate. Policy. The CCRB tracks and analyzes a wide variety of data points. We present trends and findings on an ongoing basis through public board meetings, monthly statistical reports, the data transparency initiative known as DTI and our annual and semi-annual reports. The annual report for 2017 will be released in the coming weeks. In addition to these reports, the agency produces reports on a variety of topical issues in policing and oversight. In 2017, the agency released a study examining the frequency and impact of officer interference with civilian recordings of police activity entitled Worth a Thousand Words, examining officer interference in civilian, police record, in civilian recordings of police. In 2018, five issue-based reports are planned. The aforementioned TASER report follow-up, as well as reports on NYPD's interactions with homeless New Yorkers and young people, sexual misconduct, and the impact of body-worn cameras. The CCRB will host the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement regional conference this year. This large event will bring together oversight practitioners, law enforcement, advocates, academics, prosecutors, defenders, judges, elected officials, and members of the public. And it will take place in June at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Panelists and attendees will discuss topics ranging from policing and sanctuary cities and the unique concerns of vulnerable communities to the impact of body-worn cameras and the role of advocacy in police oversight, all under the theme of building public trust. The agency is committed to making as much of its data public as possible via innovations to its DTI. The DTI is featured on the agency's website and provides descriptive data on FATO complaints against, NY, against New York City police officers. Visitors can view, interact with, and download CCRB data on four key areas of the agency's work. Complaints, allegations, victims and alleged victims, and members of service. The DTI presents 10 years of CCRB data covering more than 72,000 complaints, 210 allegations of police misconduct, 
86,000 victims and alleged victims and encompasses the approximate 36,000 current NYPD officers and their entire careers. Future initiatives. The CCRB continues to expand training for investigative staff and the agency's training unit is regularly consulted by other oversight agencies to offer guidance and support in training development. The agency remains committed to expanding and improving training given to new investigators, as well as implementing expanded and more sophisticated training for more experienced investigators. The training unit regularly revises and improves new investigator training, which is now in-house, competency-based, multi-week training program for all new investigators, including such topics as the NYPD patrol guide, investigative and interviewing techniques, evidence gathering, and substantive issues surrounding types of cases that fall within our jurisdiction under FATA. Additionally, the training unit brings in trainers to instruct staff on topics such as forensic video analysis and implicit bias. Given the NYPD's current acceleration of the rollout of its BWC program, one of the training unit's priorities for 2018 will be expanding the forensic video analysis training to all investigators. In 2017, the agency trained select senior investigators in forensic video analysis. The agency anticipates that by the end of 2018, nearly every complaint will involve analysis of one and more officers' BWC footage. Therefore, it is critical that the agency provide this training to all its investigators. A second significant component of this expansion of training will involve preparing the agency to take on investigation and prosecution of allegations of serious sexual misconduct, including sexual assault and forcible rape. At our February meeting, the board adopted a resolution directing staff to begin investigating certain allegations of sexual misconduct and to develop a plan to investigate allegations of criminal sexual misconduct. One major concern will be working to avoid re-traumatizing alleged victims of sex crimes. The CCRB takes seriously the commitment to civilians' well-being and intends to provide a designated group of experienced CCRB senior investigators with specialized training and trauma-informed care from certified professionals before the agency begins accepting complaints related to criminal sexual misconduct. Additionally, the agency took a number of steps to reduce the rate of investigations that we are not able to complete, which we call the truncation rate. Investigators now spend more time trying to reach unavailable complainants, sometimes making field visits to communicate with complainants who have difficulty reaching the CCRB offices. The agency continues to expand the Community Partners Initiative in collaboration with this council, with the New York City Council, holding special evening offices, evening office hours in participating council members' district offices across the five boroughs to accommodate individuals who do not have access to our main office during regular business hours. And the CCRB will continue to work with council members to find improved ways to reach your constituents who may be unable to travel for interviews. The agency is in the late stages of hiring the first Blake Fellow who will help determine via in-depth statistical analysis the underlying reasons for truncations and identify possible steps to ameliorate those reasons. The Outreach and Intergovernmental Affairs Unit also began to target presentations in areas with unusually high rates of truncations relative to the rate of complaints and provides more detailed information on, inve on the investigation process and the benefits of filing complaints directly with the CCRB. Complaints filed directly with the CCRB are less likely to be truncated than complaints that are referred to the agency. For example, in 2017, the truncation rate for complaints filed directly with the CCRB was 44% compared to a truncation rate of 69% for complaints that originate with the NYPD's Internal Affairs Bureau. So in conclusion, for fiscal year 2018, the CCRB has a modified budget of $16,027,278.
$12,452,798 for personnel services and $3,574,480 for other than personnel services or OTPS. An 18 percent uh, total budget increase along with a 12 percent headcount increase since uh, 2015. The FY 2018 budget reflects a decrease of $151,165 from the previous fiscal year's budget, which was $16,178,443. The authorized headcount for FY 2018 and 2019 is 187 positions, 110 positions in investigations, four positions in mediation, 24 positions in the APU, eight positions in policy and advocacy, six positions in outreach and internal and, in, and intergovernmental affairs, three positions in training, and 32 positions in administration. Due to su the support of this mayoral administration and this council, the agency is stronger than ever and better able to accomplish its mission to provide strong, effective, and independent civilian oversight for the New York City Police Department. But there is more to be done. I'm confident with your help, the CCRB will continue to flourish, improve, and lead the way in civilian oversight nationally. Thank you for your time, your continued support. The members of the executive staff here and I will be happy to answer any questions that you Thank you, Chair. And thank you all for the work that you do day in and day out. Uh, I wanted to dig into body cameras uh, quickly. I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Lanceman again. Um, so can you talk to talk a little bit more about the data sharing between uh, you and the, the NYPD? And I wanted to gauge your thoughts a little bit more on transparency around body cameras and what are some thoughts that perhaps your agency has around the release of footage? Should there be an independent body such as yours that plays a role in ensuring that uh, that footage is uh, being released in a transparent manner, not just by the department in itself. Uh, so I'll start there. Sure, and I'll turn it over to our executive director, Jonathan Darsh, who's had lots of conversations with various parties about those issues. The CCRB shares your concern that the body-worn uh, camera footage be used uh, effectively and fairly for all the residents of the city of New York. We've been working closely with the department to uh, facilitate our uh, requests for body-worn camera footage. We've, we've already made significant in headway in making it a less complicated process. When it first started, uh, we would make requests to the Internal Affairs Bureau. They would send it to uh, risk management. Risk management would send it to legal, and then it would come back to us through the same path. What we now do is we send an email directly to IAB and uh, the legal bureau at the same time, and when legal has figured out uh, responses that match our data, they send their response to us at the same time they send it to IAB. How long on average does that take? So uh, right now, requests are slightly less than uh, seven days, I think like 6.7 days, uh, and we've, we, we think we're gonna shave two days off by this new system of emailing directly between legal and CCRB. Okay. Um, let's go through, uh, so there's obviously been an uptick on complaints. Uh, can you speak to what factors are driving that? Is it outreach or, uh, and what are you seeing out there? So the CCRB has done more outreach this year in 2017 and in 2016 than it had done in the previous three years combined. We are hopeful that that outreach is, is what has uh, caused the increase, but this is the first increase that we've, we've seen in nine years in complaint numbers. So we, we just don't know if this is an outlier or if this is the start of a trend. Not nine years, it's since 2009, I, I might have misspoke there. And, uh, and obviously you can't go into individual cases, but what, can you give us some examples? Is there any one particular area that you're seeing an uptick on uh, that's troublesome? I think it's abuse of authority, is that right? So our, uh, our largest uh, 
number of allegations continue to be in the abuse of authority category. What does that mean? Uh, our top four allegations in abuse of authority are refusal to provide name and shield, uh, entering and searching premises, or improper stops, and threat of arrest. Improper stops and what? Threat of arrest. And th oh, threat of arrest, okay. And you provide those numbers transparently? Is there a report or something? Forgive me, I'm learning this. So you'll, you provide so, that in your annual report? 100%, uh, and okay. it's also released in our monthly report. We okay. update those statistics that are online uh, at www.nyc.gov slash ccrb. Okay. Um, and in the, the PMR report, um, it doesn't acknowledge the same reporting, so how do you merge the two or work with the administration to make sure that that information reflects? So the, the PMR goes off of the fiscal year, and so I, I actually met on Friday with, with uh, someone from City Hall to make sure that our data is, is, uh, is tracking the, the same way and uh, and are you seeing differences in, I mean, I, I know they do it by fiscal year. Has there been an openness to do it or does the council need to push here? No, the, so we, 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 we agree with you that there needs to be a good relationship between, and I, I'm, I apologize for blanking on the name of the, the group that does the PMMR and the MMR but we, we do have a good relationship with them and we provide them data every month on a regular basis, so our numbers match their numbers. It's just that we report them slightly differently. And I'm assuming theirs is less. <laughs> so um, let's, let's keep working together and we should have more conversations uh, around that. Um, I noticed in your report, so I see mediations, 204 cases in 2017. Um, and, and in your testimony, you state that this is at a civilian's request. I know very little civilians who go to people and say, I want a mediation. They want discipline. Obviously, I'm not saying discipline can't come out of a mediation, too. But can you speak to civilians requesting mediations? Uh, or is that a typo? Or? No, that's, that's people. We, we will only send a case to our mediation program if the civilian complainant asks for it. Many people don't want discipline. They want to talk to the officer. They want to say what they, they how they experience the interaction, and, and they want satisfaction from talking to that officer and explaining why they were upset or getting an explanation from the officer as to why they did what they did. Uh, so you're saying people want a touchy-feely so experience? Do. Some people do. Uh, and we think it is a, an important tool to improve commu police community relations when people who are interested in that process have an opportunity for it. I find that hard to believe, though. I think when most people call the CCRB or they contact our office that they want, and I'm not saying we should just outline and discipline every case, but I'm just interested in knowing what warrants a mediation and, and how would constituents who contact you say we just want to talk it over because most of the constituents that contact us want discipline and and remember we own it's only a small number of cases that do uh, have do go to mediation we had 40 uh, 4400 cases 4487 cases. yeah can you go through yeah so just go through the differentiation a little bit between mediation and discipline so there were, there were 4,487 cases in our jurisdiction. Of those cases, uh, 204. 204 were mediated, and 1,349 had uh, full investigations. And out of the full investigations, how many um, warranted uh, serious disciplinary action so in, in 2017, the, uh, the board recommended that uh, members of service receive charges and specifications 40 times, which is the most serious uh, form of discipline. Is that 40? 
40 times, not 40 cops, 40%. 40 cops, okay. 189 members of service, the board recommended a command discipline. Uh, 76 officers, we recommended formalized training and uh, 62 times command level instructions. And can you go through, are they like examples? What warrants? How does CCRB make these determinations? Sure. So we have a panel of three that uh, are made, uh, the panel's made up of designees from uh, each uh, 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 authority. So the mayor has one representative, the council has one, and the police commissioner has one. Um, we have investigators who uh, have looked at these complaints uh, and the charges within the complaints. Um, and based on the information they compile, which is quite extensive, um, the uh, panels then vote on uh, what charges we think, if any, should be applied, I'm sorry, what discipline we think, if any, should be applied to the charges that, that we are considering. And you don't find it a problem that the police department, you're supposed to be an independent body and the police department is actually a decision maker in some of these decisions. I'm not saying that they overwhelmingly represent the board, but right. if you're supposed to function as an independent body, um, why would we have an agency at the table who may differ on, you know, how do they objectively look at these cases and say, well, it should be mediation or they should be fired or, I'm, I'm just interested in knowing, and I'm not saying that they overly influence decisions, but if the CCRB is an independent body, having PD at the table when these decisions are made, you don't find that a little bit troubling, and I'm sure that's the way the structure is set up, but is that something we should look at? Well, it's, uh, they're retired uh, police officers, and theoretically they're, well, not theoretically, in fact, there are no current uh, officers who are on the the board. Okay. I think not retirees. Uh, you said in no retirees as well right now. No, no, there are retirees. Right. The three are retirees, and they can be. I think the you know the the we insist on a civilian perspective on this that has as much legitimacy as any other perspective when it comes to uh, reviewing these charges and deliberating uh, the the uh, level of discipline. Um, and I mean, it's clear we, at times we just disagree. Um, but there are a majority on every panel. There are three people and two of those three um, have had no relationship with the NYPD. And you don't think those people, individuals who uh, perhaps might have served on the force before would be more sensitive to I mean, obviously we want people who have some sort of expertise in the area, but how do you, how do we, they strike we that balance of people who've be been objective. on the force? I find that hard to do in this case, but that's something we, we should delve into a little bit more at another time. Um, allegations of serious um, sexual misconduct. Are you good at staffing levels there? And, and what motivated you to finally uh, look at this area? In, uh, this is actually, it was a, a long process for us. It started in 2015 during the LGBTQ symposium that the board had where, uh, where we heard from members of communities that uh, felt that they were the victims of sexual misconduct at the hands of police officers. And then the process really moved forward in October of 2016 when Andrea Ritchie uh, presented to the board at a public board meeting. Uh, and, and at that point, then the board took the lead on the issue and, and forced staff to, to come up with a plan to uh, see how the CCRB could, could help in this uh, in these issues and investigate these cases and so in February and last month at our board meeting the board passed a resolution unanimously deciding to investigate uh, cases of sexual harassment now and then in cases of sexual assault we continue to refer them to IAB but uh, also refer them directly to district attorney's offices 
and to develop a, a process by which we could uh, train senior investigators so that they they can handle the, those types of cases in a way that won't re-victimize victims of sexual assault. And you said in 2015 you started to look at this. How many uh, alleged cases were there that motivated you to look at this? So in, in 2016 and the first half of 2017, there were 100 and 117 cases uh, that, that we referred to the NYPD for various types of sexual misconduct. And out of those 117, do you know what actions were taken on these 117? We do not know. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So that's something uh, we're certainly interested in looking at. And, and so you have no idea if individuals who could have uh, been involved in the most grotesque um, incidents are still on the force or not. We we don't know if we did not investigate those cases, so we refer them to the department, to the Internal Affairs Bureau, and they inv we don't know the results of those investigations. Okay, and will you seek the follow-up now that you have a department? So we we re we requested the results of those investigations, but uh, we did not receive them. Okay, we will surely be following up on that. Um, can you speak to, so I noticed that it takes about 20 days for CCRB to get back to, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, on average, uh, if someone calls to file a complaint, it takes about 20 days on average for you to get back to them. Can you speak to, um, if you're looking at ways to improve that, um, and how long on average does it take you to close out a case? So the CCRB is, is, shares your concern about quickly uh, adjudicating investigations and making sure that people who contact us are, are uh, promptly uh, spoken to and their complaints are taken seriously and promptly. Uh, in 2016, the average length of a full investigation was 163 days. Uh, in 63 days for a full investigation uh, and what warrants a full investigation uh, it means that we have uh, assigned a uh, okay. complaint by a civilian and we uh, have sent the case to the board for them to uh, vote whether to substantiate unsubstantiate exonerate or unfound the allegations in the complaint and then uh, in terms of um just customer service in terms of getting back. So I think if, if my memory serves me correct, it takes about 20 days. Is that a staffing issue or so how do we get back to constituents in a more timely fashion? So I will double check that number because that, that seems. Th sounds high. That sounds high to me. And so yeah. I'll, I'll double check that with the. Okay, I could be wrong, but I think I no, no, no. remember that, looking at this but I, saying that. One of, the, one of the issues that we have uh, that, I, that the chair described in, in his testimony is the difference of uh, how long it takes to, to reach a witness who, mm -hmm. and our ability mm -hmm. to reach mm -hmm. witnesses mm -hmm. when they don't come directly to the CCRB. So if someone files their report directly with the CCRB, we can handle their case immediately. The problem is when things are referred either by 311 or uh, or from the department or from another source, it may take longer to reach out to those those people and, and arrange for them to come in and give an interview. And then so for that, witnesses, are you using things like Uber and Lyft so you could be discreet? How do we get witnesses so to come and actually testify? So can you speak to how you're making it more convenient? So. One of, the, uh, one of the things that's been very helpful in arranging, in, in allowing us to reach out to witnesses more effectively is the CPI. And we're very grateful to the council for uh, having the Community Partners Initiative that lets us meet with people closer to where they live and work and not make them come downtown uh, where at 100, and Church, 100 Church Street and, uh, and in order to give a statement. But we're, we are much more proactive about uh, either 
providing metro cards to people to come down or actually sending people out in the field to meet with uh, people in order to, to take their statements. And uh, how many complaints are you getting on average from, um, are you getting calls from like individuals on Rikers or anywhere, how many? We'll have to get you those numbers, I don't have them in, in front of me, but we do get calls from people, we get complaints from people who are being detained uh, at DOC and uh, we, we make sure to, to go interview them. So you, you have oversight over that, so you can actually so we don't so you have go to Rikers, or what would you do in a case of something? Our investigators like? would go to, to to Rikers Island. And do you have a specific unit dedicated to that, or no? No, sir. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. Just on the um, response rate to uh, people who make complaints, um, it's a 24-hour turnaround for us um, on average, and then 16 days to the actual full interview. Oh, 16 to the full. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but we, we're back in touch within 24 hours. Okay, and there's no way to shorten that 16 day, because the, the thing is when, when people call, you wanna to try to get to them as sure. fast as you can, and I understand you may be limited, so that a staffing issue, is there a way to cut that down to, I don't know, four days, three, right. you know, three could, days, and what would it take for us to get there? Right, we could certainly work on it and, uh, and be back in touch with you about right. it. Right. Uh, sometimes it's the complainant, um, and their availability, but that's something we certainly can look into. Mm. And I say that because for, for most communities, uh, throughout the Rockaways, for instance, you gotta move fast, otherwise people lose hope in the system, so I'm assuming where a lot of these uh, calls are coming from and complaints are coming from, the majority communities that we have work to do in. And um, so I think it's you know imperative for us to. We try we, tr we try and, and have those interviews happen as soon as possible, but it, it's sometimes difficult to schedule with people in such a way that. But but we take your your point. We share your desire to to conduct interviews in a prompt manner, and we're going to look at it. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then not, not only that, just on the witness end, you know, you may have a witness you need to get to as I've seen in specific uh, cases in my district, that you know, if you, you may have only a short window before they change their mind, which can affect the outcome of a case. So, so I think that that's why it's certainly imperative that we, we try to figure out uh, a more rapid response. Um, any ways we can be helpful to the CCRB um, uh, this fiscal year? Any uh, initiatives or things that uh, you want to lay out that we should be being helpful and to help you to be uh, as effective as you can be. We've we've been working with uh, the with OMB to to make sure that we're fully staffed up for any uh, additional needs we have for uh, for Right to Know Act and body worn cameras. It's been a, uh, you know, it, from, from my conversations with OMB, they understand how uh, difficult the, the strain of body-worn cameras is going to be, not just on the CCRB, but the NYPD and the district attorney's offices. And, uh, and, and so they're working with Do It for a citywide uh, solution to that situation. But we're also, they've, they've said, you know, you need to, we need to keep them posted on how our server space is looking so that we can, uh, we can make sure that we, we don't have any difficulties going forward. And they're not counting, because I know a lot of agencies sometimes are under headcount, so are they penalizing you for that, or does it seem like there's a true willingness to try to figure this out? There seems like a true willingness to figure it out. Okay. I would say there is a true willingness to, to, to to figure it out. I know you can't say anything different on the record, but um, <laughs> if you if you need a push, you have friends here. Um, I will go to Councilmember Cohen for questions now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry I missed you reading your testimony, but I think I'm caught up now. Uh, could you just expand a little bit on your testimony regarding FATO, like what are the nature of the complaints, how they break down in each category? Roger that. So we can, I can do the broad categories and then um, 
uh, our executive director can offer some uh, texture to them. If, if you could also just give a couple of examples, just so, uh, some, exa some examples of what falls into each category. Okay, well, why don't I let you do that? So uh, abuse of authority is our, our largest uh, category, and it includes uh, things such as refusal to pro provide name and shield, entering or searching a premise uh, without author proper authorization, improper stops, improper frisks, improper searches of a person, threats of arrest, improper arrests, uh, improper vehicle stops, improper vehicle searches, uh, refusal to give medical attention. Uh, in discourtesy, we have uh, discourteous words, discourteous actions, dis uh, discourteous gestures, and discourteous de either demeanor or tone. Uh, physical force could uh, be uh, hitting someone against an inanimate object, uh, pointing a gun, using a chokehold, uh, hitting someone with a fist or kicking them. And then offensive language is uh, comments uh, based on race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, immigration status, uh, uh, almost any protected class, if, if you're somehow implicating that, uh, it would be offensive language. And, and could you just, a little bit of the, the percentage breakdown per? So in 2017, uh, we received, uh, for example, uh, 911 allegations of uh, refusal to provide name and shield and uh, we substantiated 29 of those complaints, which was 3%. In, uh, in 724 allegations of improper stop, which we substantiated 66, uh, which was 9%. In the discourtesy category, we had 1,579 1, allegations of discourteous word, 58 were substantiated. Uh, we had 2,203 allegations of uh, improper physical force. We substantiated 41 for a 2% substantiation rate. And we had uh, 159 allegations of offensive language based on race of which we substantiated four. Again, uh, I'm new to the committee and it's a little bit of a learning. Could you just talk for a minute about the challenges in substantiating? I guess, I guess if a case is a he said, he said, or he said, she said, that case cannot be substantiated? Is so in order to substantiate a case, we have to have a preponderance of the evidence, which is more than 50%. Uh, one of the real benefits of the body worn camera program is it has audio as well as video. And so on many of the discourtesy or offensive language allegations, we, we're hopeful that we'll be more likely to find a decision on the merits rather than just have to unsubstantiate a case. Uh, the, uh, if you can bear with me one second. So the, uh, we, we can get back to you with the number, but it's roughly half of the cases that are fully investigated are unsubstantiated. And then uh, I think, you know, the, excuse me. And so we, one of the benefits of having every patrol officer with a body-worn camera is many of those allegations, we will be able to reach a decision on the merits rather than have to unsubstantiate them. Mr. Chairman, could I just follow up with one more quick question? In terms of right now, the body of evidence in a typical case is the testimony of the complainant and the testimony of the officer. Is that, generally speaking, the how a hearing goes down? So we we collect as much evidence as we can, other than just the statements, uh, whether it's surveillance. Video. I, I appreciate that, but in typically in a typical case, is that all the evidence you're ultimately able to collect? As w as well as uh, police paperwork. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Lance, you good? Okay, thank you for coming out. We look forward to continuing to work with you and, um, and uh, improve transparency, accountability, same thing we say to the police department. Um, uh, the stronger we are, the better our communities are. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. We're gonna call the first public panel, Davis Emil, Community Aces, uh, Access, I'm sorry, Carla Rabinowitz, Community Access, and CCIANYC, I think that's it. Tawaki Kawatsu, Ralph Palladino, Second Vice President, 1549, DC 37, and Beverly Tillery from the New York City Anti Violence Project. Uh, we're going to just ask everybody to say their names on the record, and then uh, you may begin. We're going to put three minutes on the clock, and you may begin. Hi, my name is Carla Rabinowitz. Thank you for hearing the testimony. I'm the advocacy coordinator at Community Access, a mental health housing agency, and project coordinator of CCIT NYC, a coalition of 75 organizations and stakeholders. Our mission is to improve relations with the NYPD and create a fully functioning CIT system in New York City. Um, many of you know that the Mayor's Task Force on Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice met in 2014 and then became defunct. It was to design solutions that will stop the death of mental health recipients in the hands of the police. We need that task force. We really need that task force. We need all stakeholders, all those city and state agencies at the table to suggest alternatives to, to police responding to these crisis calls or EDP calls. We need to divert these calls before they get to the crisis level. And for that, we need community funding like respite care and other alternatives. Um, some of the contributions that the task force came up to, came up with have been implemented by the NYPD, like CIT training, which is going well. But CIT training alone is not going to prevent these recurring deaths. Like neighborhood policing is to the police, we need a comprehensive change from the mayor to deal with all these crisis calls. Since the NYPD started its CIT training, at least nine mental health recipients have died in police encounters. In the last six months, three people have died. This is more than any time that I can remember in my 10 years of advocacy on this issue. We need more effective solutions. We need co-response teams that respond to crisis. The police mentioned co-response teams, but they're not responding to 911 calls. They're responding to more like wellness checks when there's a little aggression. We need co-response teams, mobile crisis teams, maybe pairing up mental health peers. Um, as I said, we need alternatives to hospitals, like respite care funding for that in the community. Um, we need to support the police by building the diversion centers or drop-off centers where police can drop off people and they get wraparound care from the community. Most importantly, we need the mayor to revive his 2014 task force of behavioral health and criminal justice. The NYPD can't do it alone. It has to be under the level of a deputy mayor, like so many other programs, so we can stop the senseless deaths that are occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Davis Emil. I am an intern at Community Access. Since the NYPD started CIT training, at least nine mental health recipients have died in police encounters. Three of the mental health community, three people of the mental health community have died in the last six months. Mario 
Ocasio, age 51, June 2015 or 2015. Rashad Lloyd, age 25, June 2016. Deborah Dania, age 66, October 2016. Ariel Grazia, age 49, November 2016. Duane June, age 32, July 2017. Andy Sukdeo, age 29, August 2017. Miguel Richards, age 31, September 2017. Cornell Lockhart, age 67, November 2017. Duane Pritchell, age 47, January 2018. We need more effective solutions. We need to expand co-response teams throughout the city, add mobile crisis teams and peer mental health pairs with police to de-escalate these encounters. These, we need to support police by fully funding diversion centers to provide a rapid handoff to New Yorkers in acute crisis from police custody to get immediate care and long-term connections to community resources. More diversion centers and respite centers will be needed as we move people from Rikers back into the community. Thank you. Point well taken. Me? There. Uh, good day. Ralph Palladino, Clerical Administrative uh, Employees, Local 1549, DC 37. Uh, I want to say uh, congratulations and welcome to the new chair. And we hope we have the same good relationship with you that we had with CM Gibson, working with her. Um, we represent 16,000 employees of the city of New York and taxpayers, I might add. Uh, we represent the PCTs in the 911 call centers and also the police administrative aides in the uh, precincts. Two issues uh, on the 911 system. Uh, in the last, since 2015, there are 100 less PCTs than there were since then. We have lost 100 people. There has been a large turnover because of the nature of the work. Uh, also the fact that there is understaffing and more overtime. Uh, people are getting worn out, uh, people are coming in, and new people are, are being put into positions where they have to work overtime in stressful situations and they wind up leaving. We believe that the hiring of 200 additional PCTs would be critical and key to keep this service going um, and uh, recapture some of the, the work. Uh, we have a situation where we have now have two centers as opposed to one. There are about 25 uh, per shift, empty cubicles in each center. That's four shifts in one, four shifts in another. That's eight shifts. Um, and we think that they should be filled and used to keep the, uh, the public safe. Uh, revenue to hire could easily be done by re the reduction of overtime that's needed, which has gone up, uh, number one. Number two, less absenteeism due to the less stress. Uh, also, the issue of le having to use less training money to train more people over and over again. And finally, this, the surcharge. The surcharge that goes on the, the telephone bills that the state collects is used for the general fund of the state. When asked uh, about it on the John Oliver Show, uh, Mayor, uh, Governor Cuomo, excuse me, Governor Cuomo uh, stated that no one has asked. Well, we are asking the city council and the city to ask. The other issue dealing with the police is civilianization. To this date, we still have almost 500 
police administrative aides positions being filled by uniforms, including school aides that they're going to want to hire this year, traffic informers agents, and police officers. Um, this despite the fact that 1549, our local, is the only entity that has filed and won arbitrations on this, and yet this NYPD has not civilianized. We don't understand why. We have less PAAs in position right now than we did four years ago. Um, and we estimate that it costs the city $31 million when they don't do that. And you do that, add that up five years, $31 million is $150 million. To add insult to injury, there have been additional grievances in the last few years on this issue as well. So we ask you to please work with us on getting more employees and service people in the uh, 911 to about the surplus, reach out to the governor, deal with the issue of civilianization immediately, once and for all, uh, and, and avoid any further litigation with the city on this, and join 1549 to request that the city controller perform an audit on civilianization of the NYPD, because they have coming back and forth with different numbers. And so let's get it together and do an audit. Thank you. And you did hear them speak of the study they're doing. Yeah. Have they and contacted you on that? No. 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 Okay. And they haven't contacted us on, on this for a while. And the thing is that the numbers keep changing. Their numbers keep changing. Okay. So let's do an audit. Okay. Thank you. We'll certainly be there with you on that. Uh, yes, sir. We have three minutes. Um, by the way, let me start with my uh, written testimony. Uh, press, press your, your mic, too. Sorry? Press your mic. Oh, thank you. All right, there you Hi. Go. Um, we met previously at the last um, public safety meeting. I tried presenting video then, but unfortunately, the IT team didn't properly set up the equipment. Um, I gave some written testimony earlier, and I'll read from that as I, I guess, try to set up this um, laptop. Um, there was a court hearing at the federal court last week on Thursday in this case against Trump. Um, the federal judge assigned to that hearing stated, once it is a public forum, you can't shut somebody up because you don't like what they're saying. Um, earlier today, you had NYPD Detective Girola, who's part of the mayor's security detail. He was in the room. Um, before you and I met, he was keeping me out of public meetings uh, throughout last year in violation of what's called viewpoint discrimination, meaning if I'm a whistleblower and you don't agree what, with what I have to say, I still have that First Amendment right to walk through the, through the doors to talk to your audience to expose the, the fact that you're a fraud, if you're saying you're ultimately responsible for policing, if you say that you support hi hiring veterans who are next door while I'm talking to you. So, um, yeah, so that's one thing. Um, also, um, there's actually a federal lawsuit against the mayor's head of security. He lost a motion in federal court on March 5th. Because of that federal judge's decision, he's going to have to stand tri trial for having violated the Fourth Amendment rights of a bicyclist in September of 2012. So the question is, if, if somebody was mayor, any average person, random, random person, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have somebody who's violating civil rights be, to be your top bodyguard while taxpayers have to fund their salary. You had NYPD Commissioner O'Neill sitting here earlier today. I talked to him on February 23rd at the New York Law School about Mr. Redmond. Um, he ducked my questions. So how does that uh, comport with the issue of transparency and accountability? It doesn't. Um, following that meeting, you, just like you acknowledged earlier, there was that BuzzFeed report where essentially exposed the fact that the NYPD is full of it in terms of the crime statistics um, they just manufacture their crime statistics, and there's no accountability. Um, so bottom line is I'm currently, I currently have to contend with a frivolous um, criminal prosecution of me for having exercised my self-defense rights on December 26th of last year after I was assaulted by members of the NYPD in the Bronx. I was walking to a store in a public area. I was illegally stopped, assaulted, seized. While in custody, they lost my wallet, so there's no chain of custody in terms of people's property while you're... Uh, what do you call it, illegally arrested. I was offered a plea deal on, what, February 20th. I immediately rejected that because I want to expose the fact that the NYPD are full of it to basically put an end to this problem. So my point is, if Mr. Redmond has been violating civil rights for six years, then at what point, just like I said in our last meeting, 
is somebody like you going to step up to the plate and swing a bat? Thank you for your testimony. Hi, Ms. Beverly. You may begin. Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Richards, um, and thank you to the entire Public Safety Committee um, for hearing my testimony today. My name is Beverly Tillery. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, or AVP. At AVP, we empower lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing, education, and we support survivors of violence through counseling and advocacy. Currently, LGBT people in this country are experiencing heightened rates of violence of all kinds, particularly hate violence. And as much as we pride ourselves in New York City as being welcoming and affirming for LGBTQ people and all people, rates of violence are at a high here as well. AVP's bilingual hotline experienced a 34% increase in calls from survivors of violence in 2017 as compared to 2016, reflecting the turbulent times that we're experiencing across the country. Yeah. 2017 was also a year in which nationally we saw an 86% increase in LGBTQ hate violence homicides, and three of those homicides happened in our city streets. John Jolly, one victim, was stabbed in August after allegedly making advances toward his attacker. Our community members and clients are reporting more incidents of hate violence in the city, at their workplaces, in their homes, by landlords, on the subways and buses they take every day. Since the presidential election, not only have we seen a spike in hate violence, but we've seen spikes in all kinds of violence, intimate partner violence, dating violence, on and on. Those in our community who are the most marginalized, people of color, immigrants, undocumented immigrants, and transgender and gender nonconforming people are disproportionately impacted by this violence. And many continually tell us that they've become afraid to travel throughout the city for fear of being attacked or harassed. Compounding the problem is the fact that survivors often feel like they have no place to turn for support and for services. In AVP's report on hate violence in 2016, only 26% of survivors in the city reported that they went to the police, representing a 53% decrease in police interaction over two years. Of those who did interact with the police, 45% reported either indifferent or hostile attitudes from the police. Many survivors have a difficult time accessing LGBTQ affirming and safe spaces uh, from providers such as shelters, healthcare providers, et cetera. Um, we provide a lot of services at AVP um, and we help advocate for our clients so that they can receive the best services possible. Our hotline, our one-on-one -on -one counseling and support groups, our economic empowerment program, legal services, community outreach, organizing, and public advocacy. Um, I respectfully ask that you continue the City Council's support of AVP and that the committee work with us on these issues so that New Yorkers can become Again, um, New York can become a safer place where our LGBT and HIV communities can thrive. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. We look forward to following up with you and certainly working with you, uh, just as the last chair, Vanessa Gibson, did on these issues. So we look forward to uh, much more dialogue and, and work on, in the near future. Thank you for your testimony. All right, we're going to go to the last panel in the public. Uh, Andrea Bowen, transgender and Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition, Kyle L. Anderson, I think he left, he board 14, uh, Charlotte Pope, Children's Defense Fund, Grace Spinks, School Crossing Guard, Chapter Chair, Local 372, DC 37, and Vivian Laborde, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. So Elizabeth Escalante, School Crossing Guard Chapter Secretary, Local 372, Vivian Laborde, Lincoln Center, Grace Spink, School Crossing Guard Chapter Chair, Local 372, DC 37, Charlotte Pope Children's Defense Fund of New York, 
Andrea Bowen, Transgender and Gender Nonconforming mm -hmm. Solutions Coalition, and then lastly, Khalil Anderson. Okay. You may begin. Uh, hello, my name is Vivian Laborde. Um, I'm the Director of Government and Community Engagement at Lincoln Center. I want to thank Chairman Donovan and members of the Committee on Public Safety um, for the opportunity to, to be here to discuss a public safety issue that is of foremost concern uh, to me and my colleagues at Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center faces a unique challenge as a nonprofit cultural institution in New York City, maintaining an accessible and hospitable yet safe and secure environment in what is by far the largest open area performing arts complex in the world. It has become increasingly difficult to maintain this standard, particularly in light of the, of the alarming rise in terrorist incidents around the world. As you know, in the last 17 months alone, there have been 11 acts of violence, most recently in Parkland, Florida. New York City has had three major incidents in the last 17 months alone. Um, the vehicle attack on the West Side Highway, the, su the suitcase bomb left on the street in Chelsea, and the, and the failed suicide bomber at Port Authority. This alarming trend is, of course, concerning to us at Lincoln Center. It's not uncommon for events at Lincoln Center to convene over 10,000 people, consisting mostly of children at a time, including at our annual Trick or Treat Halloween event and um, on our outdoor plazas and at the Big Apple Circus. As a, result, uh, as a result, Lincoln Center has been consistently on high alert, taking appropriate measures to update our campus security. Most of these efforts have focused on increasing site security, which protects several acres of city-owned property at Lincoln Center. As a result of these measures, our site security costs have risen rapidly by 1.3 million, 44% over the last four years. These rising costs show no signs of slowing down and have become increasingly difficult for us to sustain. Law enforcement has advised that Lincoln Center is at heightened risk for a terrorist attack because such an attack would fulfill two known terrorist goals, mass casualties and intensive media coverage of an attack on a prominent venue. We're calling on the city to provide more funding to help us ensure the safety and security of our public spaces for this reason. The greatest cost of any terrorist incident of, is, of course, the devastating loss of human life. However, according to law enforcement, the Im impact at Lincoln Center would extend far beyond the violent act itself. It would be a, of national significance, especially at one of our many televised or live streamed events, greatly impacting a large and dense urban geographic region. The collateral impact of such an incident would most significantly harm New York City, to which Lincoln Center organizations yearly contribute $2.4 billion in economic activity, including nearly 16,000 jobs. Uh, the proper time to address our challenges in sustaining the rising cost of site security is now, not in the wake of a major incident. Therefore, we're requesting that the council assist us in offsetting these costs with uh, $615,000 in security funding, which is the amount that we receive from D DCLA and baseline funding that we uh, currently spend in securing our, our public areas. On behalf of Lincoln Center, thank you for the opportunity to bring this important concern to the council's attention. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charlotte Pope, and I'm with the Children's Defense Fund New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, we want to highlight the policing of young people in school and shift the conversation of school safety towards initiatives that provide the structure, support, and the quality of relationships that most influence students' feelings of safety. CDF New York works in coalition with students across the city who experience policing responses as measures that fail to address and often exacerbate the underlying conditions that lead to conflict in school. This mirrors research on the school to prison pipeline that describes how the introduction of police officers to schools leads to a net widening effect, disrupts the schooling process and students' educational trajectories, escalates conflict, and has a disproportionately harmful impact on students of color who are more likely to be arrested at school for behaving in the same ways as their peers. The budget of the NYPD's school safety division continues to grow year after year at the same time that schools call for more tools and resources to implement effective alternatives. 
The city must realign its resources to reflect the critical needs of students and school staff. And with some of our partners, we're urging the city to make the following investments in fiscal year 2019. 2.4 million to sustain the council's restorative justice initiative, 2.875 million per year for direct mental health supports and services for students as an alternative to disciplinary action in 20 high need schools, and 1 million per year for whole school collaborative problem solving training and support for school staff in high need schools. Our ultimate goal is for the Department of Education to implement restorative justice citywide. We urge the council to pursue investments in whole school restorative justice models that include sustainable full-time school-based staff, youth and family involvement and decision-making, continuing professional development opportunities, and district-wide coordination. CDF New York works to engage community members in restorative practices and contributed to the development of the council's restorative justice initiative in 2015. And we ask that the council continue to push the city to prioritize sustainability and meaningful implementation. There are more details in our written testimony, so thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Grace Spinks. I'm the chair for the school crossing guards. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you and um, for the, com the safety of the community, Chairman um, Don Donovan J. Richards and distinguished members of the committee. It's the first time someone's used my middle initial. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor of um, Local 372, um, New York City's Board of Education employees, District Council 37 asked me to present tes testimony, testimony on behalf of the express approximately 2,546 school crossing guards we represent under the leadership of our president, Sean D. Francois I. A major component of ma major Mayor um, de, de Blasio Vision Zero Plan calls for a citywide plan to place a school crossing guard at every school post in throughout the five boroughs. The Vision Zero plan requires that the additional hire of 100 full-time new crossing guard supervisors, 200 part-time crossing guards, and implementation of the mobile replacement squad Approximately 25 million in the city funds over the next four years will underwrite the cost of the initiative we support as it will save many, many more of our children from being injured or worse on their way to and from school. Local 372 level one level school crossing guards are often the first line of defense to improve the safety for students who walk bicycle or taking transit to school. Student pedestrians often faces major safety traffic hazard every day caused by double and triple parked cars at bus stops in front or near school crossing building, buildings. This does remain thousands of New York City school children crossing main inter intersection without any supervision from NYPD school crossing guards, parental or adult guidance. Of the approximately of the 2,546 crossing guards, 90% of female working daily, four or five hours daily, weekly 25 hour cap part-time schedule that includes early morning, lunch, lunchtime after school hours serving 1.2 million charters, parochial or public school ch children. The school, the call still sounds loudly to demand that the city analyze this workforce force. It's imperative that these workers become full-time employment to make real investment in higher job and retention numbers and further f pays the way to much lower traffic incidents involving students and motorized public. Today, school crossing guards face 16 unpaid DOE holidays and no pay when schools are closed for bad weather or out-of-pocket health care costs during the cost of season of off-season of the summer months. 
This is no doubt that providing comprehensive safety measures to all New York City school students is the first and most significant step, step in allowing for education success. The New York, the New York Police Department, the Department of uh, um, Education and Department of Transportation must work together to better determine whether SCG placement placements are needed. It is our understanding that the city is currently undergoing undergoing a mapping program to determine if the uh, You have to wrap up. I was being kind because Susan Chin is here, and she means a lot to me. Uh, but you have to wrap up because we have you. district attorneys now. Okay, replacement of new school buildings and facilities are strongly support, support this plan. A comprehensive include utilization projects of level one and two level school crossing guards, documentation in incidents of new school opening before traffic studies have been complete, completed during in schools, children being left to fend for themselves for several weeks and months before school crossing guards deploy in their posts. Seamless edu education and coordination between city agencies can be achieved throughout the its establishment of ongoing transport transportation, progress report and school crossing guards advisory board, which includes a seat at the table for, three, for local 372. Again, thank you for the uh, opportunity to write in the testament. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Same thing, same thing, okay. Good afternoon, Council Member, uh, Chair Richards, uh, and members and staff of the public. Oh, sorry, before you begin, we've been joined by Council Member Mizell as well. <laughs> sorry. Hello, Council Member Mizell. Hello, Council Member Cohen and members and staff of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, my name is Andrea Bowen. Um, I'm a consultant working on behalf of the Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition, uh, which includes Anti-Violence Project, Audrey Lord Project, uh, GMHC, LGBT Community Center, Make the Road New York, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and the Translatina Network. Uh, I'm just gonna speak and you can refer to the testimony afterwards. Um, so, um, in 2015, the LGBT Caucus of City Council and the then speaker um, encouraged these organizations to do community forums in each of the five boroughs to see what the TGNC community need, needed. Um, and so, what came out of that were several recommendations around um, diverse issues, housing, economic, uh, housing, other economic justice issues like employment um, and policing and violence. Um, and so we have been talking to the mayor's uh, staff and agencies about a set of budget proposals, and we're also talking to council now. Um, of course, we hope that this money gets put in for the mayor's side, but in the event that it doesn't, we seek council support in getting funding for these measures. Um, I've attached a list of all of the things that we're asking for on the second side of this um, testimony, but I'm gonna focus on our policing and violence issues. Uh, within this testimony. Um, so what we're asking for is uh, $50,000 that would uh, go to CCRB, eventually be contracted out, that would go towards um, training and evaluation of how the NYPD works with TGNC communities. Um, you know, a recent report from the Inspector General's Office of the NYPD outlined a lot of deficiencies with respect to how the NYPD works with TGNC communities, um, including a lack of tracking incidents, bias incidents with LGBTQ people, um, and inadequate training of officers in TGNC uh, sensitivity provisions. Um, these problems were also brought up in the community, the borough forums that went on, and so we are asking for funding um, that would evaluate the training that is put on by the NYPD. Um, we'd like TGNC community members to work with the NYPD in sort of reshaping the training, but we'd also like evaluation money placed outside of the NYPD, so it's a little bit more independent, to evaluate what's going on. And also um, provide a little bit of money to TGNC organizations to do Know Your Rights um, literature and trainings to community members. So $25,000 for evaluation and $25,000 for Know Your Rights literature. Um, and I have 10 seconds left, so I'll just sort of leave the rest to the testimony. Um, thank you very much for your time. No problem. Um, interested in why you would put the money through CCRB? Um, 
because we, again, we did not want to go through the NYPD just so that there would be um, someone outside of the NYPD doing sort of an independent eva evaluation. Yeah. Um, and we trust the CCRB as community members um, to do that kind of work. Great. All right, thank you all for your testimony. Look forward to continuing to work with all of thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a five minute recess. Oh, I will adjourn this hearing. And we'll take a five minute resource, a recess, and then uh, we'll have the district attorneys up.